Death's Dealer Seasons of Necromancy, Book 1 By Sierra Graves Chapter 1 Emery They never had eyes. No whites, no pupils, nothing. Instead, all I ever saw were gaping holes where the eyes used to be. When I was little, I remembered asking my mom what it meant. Did we go blind when we died? But if they were blind, how come they always looked at me? Even without eyes, I sensed their gazes on me. Always. I thought by coming to the Wailing Mountain Academy of Magic, I'd be spared from seeing the dead. Part of me expected them to have wards around the campus, to ensure no dead lingered. One of these days, I'd learn to stop being so optimistic. Any optimism I had mostly came from my friend Rose, lecturing me non-stop on how to be happy and smile. The dead woman's spirit was dressed in a black ball gown. She lifted her hand like she was waving. I shut my eyes, hoping when I opened them she'd be gone. Instead, I flinched and swallowed back a curse to find her nose barely an inch from mine. The cold from her spirit shocked me to the core. My teeth chattered. Goosebumps broke out over my body, and my breath puffed in front of me. Without eyes, the dead woman stared at me. A flicker of her death and the echo of her dying scream struck me. I staggered back. She'd been stabbed through the heart by the man she loved. Death by betrayal was the worst. The spirits found it nearly impossible to move on. Under normal circumstances, I would have helped her find her way to the other side. That wasn't about to happen. Not when I was surrounded by witches, vampires, shifters, and other various races that made up the magical community at WMA. They were all normal but me, I was the freak. The dangerous freak. The dangerous freak that wasn't even supposed to be here. Emery? I jumped when Rose's hand closed around my arm. The woman's spirit shimmered out of sight, but the ghostly chill remained. I'm fine. You sure about that? Not my fault. Ghosts are freaking everywhere here. I muttered, rubbing my hands up and down my arms to get some warmth back into them. Don't they cleanse this place? Ever? They do, but I guess not enough. Rose, my one and only friend since I'd been little, glanced around worriedly, her blue eyes glimmering with magic. I don't think anyone else noticed your little freak out. You've got to be more careful here, remember? Why? Because I'm not supposed to be here, or because the second anyone figures out what I am, they're likely to go grab their torches and pitchforks. She scowled. Really? Sorry. If this line would move faster, I could get out of sight. The new semester at WMA would start two days from now in the second to last week of September. Today was the first day of check-in for new students. Returning students had arrived last week. Watching the crowd made it easy to spot who the newbies were and who already felt at home here considering many had been coming here for a few years. When you live a long time, there's never a need to rush through schooling, and hell, there was always something new to learn. Many of them gathered in small groups, laughing and chatting excitedly. Being here wasn't my idea, not entirely mine anyway. I'd been quite content with the idea of continuing to hide out with the Shadow Moon Coven for the rest of my days. Rose talked me into coming, saying I'd need more advanced training at some point. My power would continue to grow stronger, whether I wanted it to or not. WMA had the most extensive collection of magical texts on the continent. If I was going to find answers about what I could do and how to control it, they'd be here. Somewhere. Hopefully. I honestly had no idea if the texts were even available to students, but I had nowhere else to turn. Until 20 years ago, being touched by death magic or having anything to do with it meant being banished, arrested or killed. Now it was technically legal again, but we had limited rights. No one with death magic was even supposed to be near Burning Glade, the capital of the magical races in North America, let alone attending WMA. But here I was, doing both in hopes I'd be able to advance my skill in regular magic, and that somehow it'd strengthen my death magic. Finding another like me, who was willing to pass on all they learned was nearly impossible. There were so few of us left and those that were kept to themselves. 
No one believed this tiny bit of freedom would last. They remembered the horrors witches had suffered during the last 150 years. It was like the burning times all over again, except it wasn't humans doing the persecution. The line moved again, and finally I made it to the table. Name? A bored-looking vampire asked, wearing sunglasses to protect her eyes from the late afternoon sun. The check-in tables were in the shade within the breezeway. Emery Dupree, I said, using Rose's last name like I'd been doing for years. If anyone asked, we were cousins. That story had worked so far. I prayed to the goddess it'd hold up a few years more. The vampire rifled through manila envelopes in the box beside her, and pulled one out. Here you go. Room assignment, orientation schedule and your class schedule. Everything you'll need is in there. I took the envelope with a mumbled thanks and stepped to the side to wait for Rose. She flirted with the shifter holding out her envelope. I rolled my eyes. Typical Rose. Had to flirt with anything that moved. Our coven was located two hours north of Burning Glade and WMA, tucked away in the Rockies. Unlike the capital though, it was a small community and she dated every witch there. She was wild, too wild for anyone we grew up with. She had a reputation for being a heartbreaker. When she laughed loudly, I sighed and moved further out of the way. Someone walked right into me and I cursed. I stammered an apology, wincing when I realized I still stood on said person's foot. My cheeks burned, and I remembered why hiding was much easier than attempting to deal with people. It's all right. Maybe watch where you're going next time. A deep voice replied. I raised my gaze and then raised it even more to find a vampire looking back at me, his cold hand gripping my elbow to stop me from falling back into more students. It was the same arm that was currently concealed by the long black sleeve of my shirt. I tensed without meaning to. My pulse raced. Eyes so pale they were almost white narrowed. I hadn't cast any illusion spells on my arm that morning, and I regretted it now. His grip tightened. I made ready to tear myself free, but he released me and cleared his throat. My foot. Do you mind? I frowned and glanced down. Oh damn. I'm sorry. It's fine. Be sure not to step on anyone else's feet today. Might send the wrong impression. His lips lifted in a curious smile, and with a subtle nod, he was on his way. It was impossible not to check him out while he strode away, hands casually shoved in the pockets of his black slacks. His dark blue silk button-down shirt brought out the tiny bit of blue that was in those pale eyes. He was lean, but his grip on my arm told me that meant nothing as far as muscle went. A light breeze blew his long blonde hair lightly when he passed through another stone archway leading deeper into the building. What are you drooling over? I checked my mouth. I should be asking you that. Did you get that poor guy's number already? Rose giggled. I might have. You're hopeless. Says the chick who was watching someone very keenly. It was nothing. It can't be. Ready to go to our rooms now? I walked off, leaving her to catch up with me. Thankfully, our heavier luggage had been taken from us when we arrived, so all we had with us were our large cloth tote bags. Rose's mom, Debbie, had made them for us as a going-away present. Each one had been blessed to promote optimism and a bit of protection, just in case. There was also an enchantment placed on them, so no one could reach inside except us. Thinking of Rose's mom made me picture my parents. It would have been nice to visit them, but I doubted I'd ever see them again. A familiar bitterness had my stomach churning, and my right side gave a twinge the same time the scar on my neck did. With a shaky breath, I told myself to get a grip. Today was my first day at WMA. I was not going to focus on the bad shit in my life. The goal was to focus on the good. I didn't have the heart to tell Rose her mom's optimism enchantment wasn't strong enough. Happiness simply wasn't something I was allowed to experience. Not true happiness. We wandered across the courtyard overflowing with gardens bursting with flowers and shrubs, green grass and stone pathways. The leaves of the trees were already starting to change from dark greens to yellows, reds and oranges. 
The afternoon gave way to evening, bringing a chill to the air. From the middle of the open ground, snowy peaks were visible over the turrets and towers that created WMA's intimidating appearance. A long time ago, WMA had been a fortress. The drive here had taken us through winding roads, leading higher and higher into the mountains. We weren't too far from the timber line, if I remembered correctly. The academy itself was made up of one massive building in the shape of a five-pointed star. It was more of a fortress than a modern human college. Dorms, the rec area, dining hall, and study rooms took up the north side of the structure. The library, classrooms, offices, and training grounds occupied the remaining sections. The walls were made of black and gray stone with magic running through them. They were mostly wards for protection, but some was what seeped into the heart of the place over centuries of standing sentinel while previous attendants learned to hone their skills. An open breezeway lined the perimeter of the courtyard with several sets of jubble wooden doors leading further inside. I had a map to guide us to our dorms, which was good. The place was a maze. I was going to get lost at least once this semester. Inside, our way was lit by lanterns hanging from the ceiling that never burned out, and more at every cross-section and doorway or stairwell. Owls soared silently overhead, roosting in the network of wooden beams that made up the ceilings. Several bats hung in the darker shadows above us, but they didn't freak me out, not like they did Rose. I know Mom told me what to expect, but bats inside the halls. Rose shuddered, her gaze repeatedly flicking upward. They're only bats. Yeah, not everyone is weird like you, she teased, then cleared her throat uncomfortably when I didn't laugh. Did you see these paintings? They all look so serious. Guess you have to be serious when you're trying to maintain order in a place like this. On either side of the main thoroughfare were paintings of past headmasters and headmistresses. None of them smiled at the students walking beneath the gilded black and silver frames. High up on the wall in the first row, was a face I knew from the history of my family. After all, we shared the same last name. Not the one I used in public. No, she bore the Dravosh name. Emily Dravosh. I was honestly surprised to find her face up there after what she did, or what she was accused of doing, rather. There'd never been any proof of her crimes, but she was banished all the same. Technically speaking, she was what they claimed, but she never hurt anyone unless it was to protect her students. Rose said my name, and I tore my gaze away from my ancestor. We maneuvered our way through more groups of students who were talking and joking, casting magic and causing a ruckus. The entrance to the dorms was a massive stone archway carved with vines and roses. The word dormitory perched in silver letters on a plaque above it. Once we passed beneath it, we climbed the stairs to the fourth floor and headed to our assigned rooms. A heavy skeleton key was in my envelope and I pulled it out when I reached room number 103. I slid the key into the lock, turned it, and pushed open my door. Holding onto a key the entire year would be a pain, but when I went to pull it out, it was gone. Rose? I asked her, standing at the room beside mine. What happened to the key? Remember? You only need it once, then the room recognizes you. No key needed. I shook my head. Right, got it. Debbie had told us so much about this place, I'd forgotten half of it by the time she put us on the bus to bring us here, too nervous to retain much. See you in a bit. Rose nodded. I stepped into my room. The door closed silently behind me, and I dropped my tote bag on the bed against the right wall. A narrow doorway led to a small private bathroom. An antique wardrobe took up half the other wall instead of a closet and next to it was a solid wood desk with a remarkably uncomfortable-looking chair. The walls were painted a deep green that was homey and matched the bedding. Several fresh candles and a few other supplies that being a witch, I'd use daily lined the shelf. A small table bearing a cast-iron cauldron took up the bit of space beneath the large picture window framed by ivory curtains. My view was of the mountains, their snow-covered tops stretching as far as I could see into the distance. I rested my hand on the glass, not fully believing I was here. We'd been on the waiting list since we were 18. Finally, right after we both turned 21, we received our acceptance letters. I'd been more terrified than excited that day, 
realizing this plan of ours was coming true. It'll be worth it, I whispered. As long as you don't get caught. The rest of my luggage had been brought up earlier. I took a few moments to unpack, not wanting to worry about it while I was getting through orientation. With my suitcase empty, I set it aside and rested my hand on the clasp of my sizable black travel bag. It glowed briefly and snapped open when I removed my hand. Inside were the magical items I'd collected and created over the years, things that decorated my personal altar at home. Many of the small statues, the candles, the offering bowl, and dried herbs were like what any other witch would use. The only item I had to hide was of the raven, half living and half dead. It had been passed down through my family from one witch to the next, and used by those touched by death magic. Once upon a time, it belonged to Emily Dravosh. The weight of it in my hands wasn't merely physical, but also magical. Anyone who encountered it would know the kind of magic I possessed. I hated to do it, but for now the statue was safer tucked out of sight. I put it back in the black wooden altar box I transported it in, and hid it inside the wardrobe on the top shelf. I didn't like it being out of sight. It was like a small piece of me was being carved out and locked away. No one could find out what I was. Tensions were too damn high when it came to death magic. Necromancer had become a cursed word ever since the banishment took place. There were a good number of soups who didn't think we deserved to exist. The chances of some of those being here were high, considering many of these students had relatives serving on the Eternal Ember, our ruling governing party, or worked in government and the guard. I rested my fingers one more time on the box and finally closed the wardrobe. I shoved my luggage under the bed and walked into the bathroom to freshen up. Running my fingers through my long, ebony hair fluffed it a bit, though I wasn't sure why I cared. I wasn't here to pick up guys. I dated a few witches back home, but was never comfortable enough around any of them to let down my guard. Rose said it came from years of hiding who and what I am, and the trauma that decided to rear its head some days. She was right, but it wasn't like I could do that here. I was better off keeping to myself. I stared at my reflection. My dark green eyes filled with apprehension at how I would get through this semester in one piece. I'd brought a fresh shirt in and removed the one I wore but didn't put the new one on yet. Slowly, I traced my fingers up my right forearm to my shoulder, wishing I didn't have to hide the tattoos. I was gifted with my first one at the age of seven. I'd stumbled across a spirit wandering the woods near our home. He was young like me and had been crying lost and confused. Back then, I had no idea what I was doing, but I'd been able to help him find his way home to the other side. The next morning, I'd awakened to find the tattoo of a raven covering my entire right shoulder, its wings spread wide. Half of it had been living and the other half dead. He was my guide, had been for the last 14 years of my life. The next tattoo appeared beneath the raven. An owl who came to life, warning me when death was near. Most of the time, it was always shifting beneath my skin. I'd grown used to the sensation over time and ignored it now unless it attempted to break free. That meant someone was going to die. It had only happened a few times, but it had been enough. Occupying the space at my forearm and wrist was a hare, appearing with a half-skeletal face. She was the one who led me to spirits in desperate need of help. Mostly it was those trapped either by their emotions or magic, and were unable to get free. Thankfully, I'd only encountered a few of those. The owl shifted against my skin, and I rested my hand on him to calm him down. I know, I whispered. We're surrounded by the dead. Can't do anything about it. When I lifted my head, my face had taken on the guise of a skeleton with dark, sunken eyes and bone-white skin. I smirked at my reflection remembering the Halloween decorations Rose and I had seen year after year in the stores on the few occasions we ventured away from home. The face I had now was what they used to decorate themselves for Halloween to scare each other. Boo, I whispered and laughed. My face returned to normal, and I tugged on my clean shirt, black lace overlaying a violet silk shirt. I tugged down the sleeves. After what happened earlier with that vampire, I did a quick illusion spell on my body to hide the markings of my magic. 
My cheeks flushed, thinking of the blonde-haired vampire. Stop it. You're not here to flirt. So he was hot, so what? He's also a vampire, which means he'll hate you the second he finds out the truth. I waited for the image of his face to get shoved to the side, but those pale blue eyes stayed with me. It had taken years of therapy with Rose's mom and the elders in her coven to ease the memories and the pain and fear that came with them. I couldn't attend the academy if I screamed every time I saw a vampire. Not all of them were murderous assholes, that's what I had to remind myself. A knock came at my door, and I hurried to open it. Ready? I'm starving, Rose complained. Yeah, I'm good. You all settled in. For the most part, I replied while we followed the crowd of students heading downstairs to the dining hall. Tonight there'd be a brief introduction of the staff by headmistress Julia Fairmain, but mostly it was about eating, drinking, and making new friends. I rolled my eyes, recalling those words from the orientation letter. I planned on finding a corner and staying in it until Rose was ready to turn in for the night. Tomorrow we'd have a more in-depth tour of the grounds, the classes we were taking, and go over the rules of WMA. I was anxious to simply get started on my studies and dig into the library. We were about an hour into the welcoming party when I told Rose I needed to step outside and get some fresh air. There were too many people in here, alive, dead, and undead. The chill was making it hard to focus. With my hot cider in hand, I stepped out into the frigid night and gazed up at the stars. A hissed shout caught my attention, and I frowned following the raised set of voices around the corner. Staying out of sight, I pressed my back to the wall and listened. Not what he would have wanted, the first voice snapped. He was too far away to make out his face, but the hissing undertone to his words made it clear he was a vampire. It's not what any of us want. You don't speak for all vampires, you know that. I know why you hate them, but it's been a long time. I think it's time, as do many others. I stilled at the familiar voice. Was it the vampire I'd spoken to earlier? He continued, It's been twenty years since the ban was lifted and nothing has happened yet. Whatever damage was done in the past needs to stay there. Too many are scared to even come out of hiding at this point. Let it go. You don't understand and you never will. You were spared the horror of what death magic can do. I tensed at the venom in his words. Maybe, but the eternal ember wouldn't put our people at risk. No? How can you be so sure? Because I am. I know you don't want to hear it but I think it's time you finally find a way to put this seething anger behind you. You and I both know enough blood has been spilled on both sides. Their steps and voices trailed away, and I let out the breath I'd been holding. It was no secret most of the supernatural world was still wary of death magic, the vampires especially. I'd been confronted once before with such open hatred, and hearing the fury in second vampire's growling voice left me shaking. Maybe coming here, wasn't a good idea. I walked quickly through the courtyard, figuring I'd go to my room when the undead woman from earlier manifested to my right as the owl on my arm came to life. I cursed, stumbling over my feet. Those empty holes where her eyes should have been stared through me and into my soul. What? I whispered harshly, wishing one of these days spirits would remember a thing called personal space. The woman's brow furrowed, her mouth open in a silent scream. She was in pain, and when she shoved her hand through my chest to my heart, I gasped, fighting against the cold coursing through my veins. She was trapped here, held back by fear and pain. So much pain. She jerked her arm free, and I clutched a hand to my chest, knowing what I had to do and hating myself for it. A quick look around told me I was alone, but the courtyard was too exposed. Can you follow me? The woman nodded. I jogged toward the first set of doors I could find which led inside. Finding an unlocked door to a classroom only took a few minutes. Once inside, I locked it and made sure I was out of view of the windows. The woman stayed with me while I knelt in the corner, tugged up my right sleeve, rested my hands on my thighs and closed my eyes. Death magic was cold and heavy. Each time I used it, the same sensations of being dunked into an icy lake made my teeth chatter and frost form on my hair. In the early days, 
the cold had made it nearly impossible to concentrate. Now I embraced it and settled into it like an old friend. Without opening my eyes, I knew the hair had come to life and sprouted from the tattoo on my arm. The furry creature nudged my hand with her tiny, icy nose. When I opened my eyes, the woman's spirit hovered in front of me, but the classroom was gray and faded like I was looking at it through a veil. I was in the spirit realm. Here, I was able to see not only the spirits that had moved on, but what bound this woman to this location in the realm of the living. Dark chains wound around her body. They shifted and moved like they were alive, and in a way they were. Each link was created from her suffering and anger, adding to the weight that wouldn't let her move on. I raised my right hand, and the hair bounded to the spirit. She turned into a wisp of pure white light of hope and love, two things no one ever liked to associate with death magic. The hair zipped around the woman, causing the chains to break and clatter to the floor at her feet. The hair returned to my side, and after nudging my hand once more she resumed her place on my arm. The woman smiled, the sorrowful gray tinge to her body lightening. She turned and floated away. I didn't have to keep watching to know she'd left the grounds. Lowering my head I shut my eyes and the cold washed away, starting at my head and ending at my toes. When the last bit of it was gone, I shivered and opened my eyes back in the realm of the living. Black irises had grown around me. I collected them and shoved them in the nearest trash can. Shaking the frost from my hair, I waited for the dizziness to pass and walked unsteadily to the door. Crossing into the spirit world always drained me. I was almost to the dorms when a shadow parted from the wall to my right, startling me. Instinct kicked in. I let my fist fly, striking whoever it was in the face. A sharp hiss of anger hit my ears, and a pair of red eyes flickered to life. Chapter 2 Alistair After sending Gentry off with the firm, friendly advice not to get caught up in the politics of his coven while he was focusing on his studies and teaching, I returned to the courtyard. Someone had been listening to our conversation. I sniffed the air, picking up the faintest scent of cinnamon. This morning when that witch ran into me, she'd smelled of cinnamon, only for a moment. Wondering if it was her who'd been eavesdropping, I followed the scent across the courtyard and back inside. The further I walked, the stronger the smell became, until it shifted to apples like I strolled through the orchards on the grounds. But we weren't anywhere near those. I sniffed again and the scent weakened but the trail was still there. I expected her to take a path back to the dining hall, but instead, she seemed to be heading for the dorms. Taking a chance, I went that way in hopes of cutting her off. When her head of ebony hair appeared, I'd stepped out, meaning to speak to her, but hadn't expected the punch to the face. My anger spiked at the strike. I hissed, snatching the offending hand that had struck me. A pair of wide green eyes looked back at me while she cringed. Shit, I'm sorry. Her voice shook with fear, and I instantly released her wrist. She seemed to have some internal argument with herself. Her cringe gave way to an aggravated frown. Maybe you shouldn't sneak up on people like a creeper. I wasn't being a creeper, I argued after my fangs retracted and my anger ebbed. You shouldn't randomly punch people. It was instinct. To strike a stranger in the face. That's twice now you've assaulted me. Her eyes narrowed. Do you mean when I accidentally stepped on your foot? Yes. She crossed her arms, her nails digging into her arms, and her heart raced. She was pale too, far paler than she'd been earlier that day. It's been a rough day, she murmured. Perhaps you wouldn't be so jumpy if you weren't eavesdropping on other people's conversations, I said lightly, wondering what she'd do. Her heart rate jumped and she took a half step back. I have no idea what you're talking about. Why did she look like she was afraid she was about to be carted off for eavesdropping? She was shaking, her teeth chattering. It was cold tonight, but not that cold. It's all right. I'm not going to report you or anything, I assured her. She backed away, nodding, but I followed, intrigued more than anything about what she was doing out here in the first place. Why aren't you with the others in the dining hall? Shouldn't you be getting drunk and partying with all the other first years and the other young people? Never really been one for parties or crowds. 
Why aren't you in there? You don't look that much older than me, she said, and my brow arched. But you're a vampire, so I'm guessing you're not twenty-something. Turned when I was twenty-five, but certainly not that young now, though I'm a student here, as well as a teacher. Third time around. You must really love this place. Has its moments, I replied. She glanced over her shoulder and retreated another step. I'm going to turn in for the night. Long days are coming. Word of advice? I said when she turned to leave. I might not care you overheard our conversation, but others won't be so understanding. I wasn't eavesdropping on purpose. No? I questioned, staying with her while she continued to back up. Look, I stepped out to get some air and I heard raised voices. That was it. She shifted uneasily on her feet, tugging on the raven charm hanging from a chain around her neck. The torchlight caught a thin pale scar running from her jaw to the crook of her shoulder. The injury was old, piquing my curiosity at what caused it. I'm not used to being around that many beings, she added quietly. I tilted my head at her choice of word. I see. Sure you do. She gulped started to say something, but walked away instead. I didn't catch your name, I called after her. She paused at the threshold. Not looking back she replied, I didn't give it. I shoved my hands in my pants pockets, intrigued by this witch. She hadn't merely stepped outside for fresh air. The subtle shifts of her body told me that was a lie or partial one. The scent of apples and cinnamon mingled where she'd stood, and I breathed it in. Wondering what frightened her so badly, I returned to my room, located in the faculty wing. This would be my fifth year teaching, but my third returning as a student. I might be approaching 150 years of age, but there were still many things I had to learn about magic. I'd been a witch in life, and was one of the few vampires able to hold on to some of my power after I was turned. Some vampires were able to access magic even without being a witch first, but it took decades of study and practice to manipulate those forces around us. So here I was, attending classes on advanced magical theory, among others, that would help me regain the use of the magic that once flowed so freely through my veins. Back in my rooms on the fifth and top floor, my windows specially designed to block out the harmful rays of the sun, I went to the kitchenette and poured a glass of red wine. That witch's peculiar behavior stayed with me, while I wandered through my small apartment to the study. She certainly didn't act like many of the other first years who came here. She seemed nervous this morning when she bumped into me. That nervousness had turned to fear tonight, though I had no idea why. And there was a different energy about her, like her magic had a heaviness to it I couldn't explain. I sensed she was strong but she hadn't acted like it tonight. And those eyes, those eyes had seen darkness. Had been touched by it at some point, but not the same way I had been. There was something odd about her. I peered out the windows overlooking the mountains, wondering who she was and what she was doing here. She would have to remain a mystery until tomorrow. Tonight, I had lesson plans to go over. I sat down at my desk ready to get to work, ensuring I'd be prepared for the first few days of classes, when a deep voice came from my left. Why am I not surprised? I check in on you, assuming that maybe for once in your young life, you'll go have some fun. But lo and behold here you are, bent over a desk studying. I set down my pen and smiled. You only have yourself to blame. Is that right? The vampire in the full-length mirror said, looking back at me. Technology didn't work here, but we had our own ways of contacting one another, enchanted mirrors being one of them. His eyes glimmered with amusement, and I turned my chair to face him. I could see not only him, but also the room in which he was in, same as he could see my study. How is it being back as a student again? I sipped my wine, debating how to answer Roderick's question. Feels like my second home. Therese's right. We may never get you back from that place, he said with a wink. We never stop learning. One of your many lessons, if I recall. I shared the same surname as Roderick Talbot, seeing as he was the one who turned me and brought me into the folds of the House of the Phoenix, his coven. He was the ruling prince of our house and had been for the last three hundred years. During my time as a witch, I'd worked closely with his house and the vampires in it. 
We'd been allies. My parents had been killed when I was young, and over time, Roderick came to be a father figure to me. When tragedy struck and would have ended my life, it was he who turned me and saved me. I'd been 25 at the time. Since then he taught me all he knew and claimed me as his rightful heir and true son. His wife and ruling princess, Teresa, made me part of their family, and I would be forever grateful for it. I should be asking you how the first day of the new session was. I laughed when Roderick poured himself a goblet of wine, dragged over a chair and sat in it. That good? He chuckled. Boring. You know how the first day is. It's essentially everyone catching up on what the houses, covens and packs have done since our last session, which in all honesty, is tedious. Tomorrow will prove to be a bit more interesting. His gray eyes narrowed with concern. Have anything to do with the necromancers? I asked. The only time Roderick's age showed was when he was stressed. Tonight, in the light of the flickering candles and firelight behind him, the lines on his forehead appeared deeper than normal. His black hair always had gray in it, but I was sure new strands manifested while he stared into his silver wine goblet. How did you know? Not hard to guess. New propositions. Yes to start. It was one thing to lift the ban on having death magic, but now there are proposals to give them special protections. Several members of the Eternal Ember are even discussing, allowing them to hold positions inside the governing party and our fighting forces as they had before. A few others say, we need to lift the restriction on necromancers being able to attend magical academies. They need teachers too. I don't see the problem with their wanting to learn. True, he mused, but keeping them separate will ease the concerns of many of our kin. I'm sure it's going to be an exhausting week, filled with arguments and discussions and yelling. There's always at least one brawl. Didn't you start the last one? He barked a laugh and lifted his goblet in a toast. He had it coming. Damn shifters. Do you think any of those proposals will pass? Last I heard, none of the sitting vampires want them to have any more rights than the right to live if they keep to themselves and don't go about using death magic on anyone, he said with a hiss. The shifters are another matter entirely, but then again, they don't have to live with the fear that one of these necromancers would be able to possibly control them or those under their protection. And anything that messes up our lives, well, you know the shifters will vote for it. I hissed quietly with him. The history of the shifters and vampires had never been an easy one. What about the witch covens? Last count three for and two against, but that could easily change. The vampires were already arguing with those three today. Brolin voiced his opinions quite loudly before we left the chamber. He's not the only one. Gentry. I sighed, setting my glass aside. He's sore about necromancers being able to come out of hiding. Not many have, which is where some of the hesitations lie. What do you mean? I asked curiously. Rumors are spreading that the necromancers aren't coming forward because they're plotting against us. If they wanted to attack, I'm sure they would have done it decades ago. Not waited until 20 years after the ban was lifted, I stated. If only I could be as understanding as you, but I was around during those difficult times. I recall all too clearly many who weren't. As does Gentry, and the rest of the House of the Red Moon. I couldn't argue with him on that point. Gentry was turned 45 years before me, and had watched many of his family destroyed by necromancers, including the vampire he once loved. His house had been decimated during one of the final battles. He never got over that rage. I watched it eat at him every day, no matter what he said to convince me otherwise. The necromancers would find no sympathy from the Red Moon vampires. Hell, they might not find any at all with any of my kind. Alistair, something else on your mind this evening? Roderick asked. Like what? You have that glint in your eyes, one that tells me you have a new problem to solve. Or a riddle. He winked. Who is she? I shifted in my chair, avoiding his look. I never mentioned a she. You don't have to. Someone clearly has you puzzled. I rolled my eyes while Roderick laughed. 
It's a witch, and I'm not saying I'm interested in her, but she's certainly different. Different can be good. Or not, I argued quietly. There's something about her I can't quite figure out. Good thing you have all semester to try then. It's about time you found someone to date. All I said was she was different. I never said anything about asking her on a date. I'm a bit busy now, anyway. Not that she'd date me anyway, when she was prone to punching me on sight out of fear that I'd what, attack her. I shook my head, unable to forget the panic on her face. Son, you're never too busy for the right woman. You're getting sappy in your old age. Roderick chuckled. Maybe. My brow wrinkled at the hint of sadness in that one word. Everything else okay? Huh. Oh yes, everything else is fine. I'll check with you in a few days. He smiled once more and pressed his hand to the frame of the mirror. The magic ended, and I was left staring at my own reflection. What he said about dating the witch had me muttering under my breath. I turned back to my lesson plan, but was quickly distracted by dark green eyes and long ebony hair that was almost blue in the moonlight. The sharp scent of apples teased me until the sun came up, and I was ready to turn in for a few hours of sleep. Whoever that witch was, my gut told me she was going to be trouble. Orientation passed by in a rush, like it usually did, and it was finally the first day of classes. I hadn't seen much of the black-haired witch on campus. I was ready to brush off my encounter with her, until I opened the door to my first class of the day, a history of our supernatural races. I'd been teaching it for the last few years and immensely enjoyed it. And there sitting in the back row like she was trying to hide was the witch. I wrapped my knuckles on her desk. She cursed, shooting me an annoyed glance. I grinned and was surprised to get a smile in return. It only lasted a second, but at least she hadn't punched me. Sorry, thought you saw me. Admit it, you enjoy sneaking up on people. Small chance of that. You're not going to punch me today, are you? I don't plan on it. Why? Seeing as I'm your professor for the next two hours, I'd have to report you. I winked and strolled down the dark wooden steps leading to the front of the small, auditorium-style room. Behind me, the witch cursed again. I stifled a laugh. Everyone take your seats, and we'll get started. I'm Alistair Talbot of the House of the Phoenix, and I'll be your professor for the semester, I announced. I thought I heard the witch curse again and hid my smirk. I probably should have mentioned who I was during our second encounter. She knew now. I took a piece of paper and passed it around for the students to write their names on to tell me who was who. Now who wants to dig into a little history? The whole time I lectured, I walked around the room. I'd never really been one to sit still. I was more for engaging the students, even those that were older than me. WMA didn't turn away any supernatural being based on their age. The entire two hours, I found my gaze continually drifting to the back of the room, searching for a particular set of green eyes. Each time she'd look away, avoiding me, but she was smiling and there was a flush to her cheeks. And that's it for today, I said after checking the time. We'll pick this up on Thursday. The students talked, packing up their books and bags. Most of them did. The witch never said a word to anyone. Sensing she was about to hasten out of the room, I blurred to her the second she stood. Flinching, she dropped the books in her arms. Sorry about that. Suppose I should start announcing myself first. The same unease I sensed in her the other night was back. She puffed out her cheeks, let out a loud breath, and grinned for a second. Sure you are. Nice lecture by the way, Professor Talbot. Or is there something more formal I should call you? Alistair is fine. Professor when I'm teaching. My father is the current prince, not me. I bent and scooped up her books. You going to save me the trouble of deciphering your handwriting, and tell me your name? You'll figure it out, eventually. Her eyes widened a hint but not at me. She seemed to be gaping at something over my shoulder. The flush drained from her cheeks and she hugged herself like she was cold. When I turned to look, there was nothing there. I, ah, uh, I have another class. 
she rushed away, tugging her tote higher on her right shoulder. Grunting, annoyed at my failed attempt at shit, I wasn't even sure what that was, I left the classroom. I didn't flirt, and dating wasn't on my agenda for the semester. Evidently, Roderick's ideas had gotten into my head more than I knew. I exited the classroom and meandered through the corridors toward my next class. Paying attention to the lecture on law proved nearly impossible. When I rose to leave two hours later, I frowned at the open page in my notebook. I'd sketched a set of eyes and part of her face framed by long tendrils of black hair. Unsure what was wrong with me, I took my hour break in the dining hall, keeping to myself at a corner table while I went over the sign-in sheet for my first class. The witch hadn't been the last one to sign it, but there were only ten seats in a row, and she'd been on an end. The class had been full too. Finding her name in a messy scrawl, I smiled. Emery Dupree, I whispered, sitting back in my chair. Nice to meet you. The name fit her, but I was trying to figure out why I even cared. I told myself I was merely curious about why she was so damn jumpy and afraid. It shouldn't even matter. She was simply another witch, and I had too many other issues on my plate. Adding trying to get to know Emery was not going to be one of them. Roderick kept hinting at my taking on more responsibilities within our family soon. That's where my focus needed to be, despite his notion that I needed to have fun and date, as though I was really the 25-year-old I looked like. Later that night, I sat in another auditorium-style room, waiting for the advanced magical theory class to begin. Several students who'd been standing in front of me sat, and there she was. Emery's head rested in the palm of her right hand while she doodled with her left. At some point she'd drawn her hair up into a clip, exposing the back of her neck. A subtle hint of cinnamon wafted toward me, and my seat creaked when I shifted. Emery glanced over her shoulder and stilled when our eyes met. It had only been a few hours since I saw her, but a strange coldness swelled in those emerald depths. She quickly turned back around and hunched her shoulders. Why did she have to be such a mystery? A puzzle that needed solving. I quietly told myself to ignore her until she sat up. Light from the lanterns overhead hit the back of her neck, and it was my turn to freeze. Tattooed on her skin was a small black iris. The flower wasn't what had my eyes narrowing. It was the birthmark beneath it, two crescent moons pressed back to back. I'd heard of that mark and about the ones who had it, as had every vampire over the last thousand years. The next two hours dragged by. The moment the professor dismissed us, I was out the door and heading for my rooms. I'd just made it there when I remembered I told Gentry I'd stop by to have a drink and celebrate our first day as was our tradition. His door was a few down from mine. I was wondering when you were going to turn up, Gentry said, after letting me in and shutting the door behind me. Late class. Long day. I shrugged, following him to the small kitchenette. He poured two shots of whiskey and handed one over. To first days. We clinked our glasses and shot them back. I hissed, enjoying Gentry's specially mixed batch of whiskey with blood. Amazing what a bit of magic during the aging process could do. I held out my glass for a second. Gentry's brow rose but he obliged me. Thanks. What's going on with you? Nothing. Doesn't look like nothing. You were fine yesterday. Don't tell me you're getting shit from your students already. No it's not them, or not all of them. I ran a hand down my face, stalking to the picture window overlooking the courtyard. One in particular. He studied my face in the window and snapped his fingers. Did Alistair Talbot finally find someone he likes enough to date? What is it with you and Roderick suddenly? If I need to date, then so do you. A dark shadow passed through his eyes and they flared red. I'm sorry but it's true, I said. You're the one that needs to learn to socialize and not hide in your apartment all semester when you're not in class. We've had this conversation too many times before for you to know how it's going to end. I held up my hand, letting it go. Fine? Fine? He growled and poured himself another shot. Tell me about this student. Nothing to tell. She's a witch. And? 
and nothing, I muttered. She's different, is all. There's something about her uh, I can't figure out. She's about as sociable as you are. He grunted in response. I smirked. She punched me the first night of orientation. What? Why? I startled her. She'd been eavesdropping on us, accidentally, according to her. I found her after I left you. She's very jumpy, has this nervous energy about her that doesn't seem to make sense. And those eyes, I went on quietly, they're filled with so many emotions it's hard to figure out what she's feeling. There was sadness in them. And fear. When I glanced up, Gentry's brow was arched while he held out another shot for me. I don't want to date her. Sounds like she's you're captivated by her. I held onto the shot glass, unsure if I should tell him what I saw or not. I don't think it's a good idea, not until I understand her a bit more. If you ask her on a date, you could do that. Get to know her. It's not something I should do. His gaze turned calculating. Absently, he swirled the whiskey around in his shot glass. There has to be a reason, he argued. You don't do anything without thinking it through. What's stopping you? She with someone? No. Then what, he demanded, and I hissed quietly for him to back off. Seriously, what's gotten into you? You don't seem like you're the typically happy Alistair self. What? Don't you like me acting like you? No, it's weird. Why don't you want to date her? She has the mark, I blurted, and immediately wished I could take the words back. Gentry's body stilled, and his eyes burned. What mark? Nothing, forget I said anything. What mark, Alistair, he snarled, and the shot glass shattered in his hand. He stomped toward me, his eyes glowing brighter with every step. Two crescent moons, I whispered, and he growled. I only saw it for a second. It might not even be there. Gentry, did you hear me? I'm not sure what I saw. You wouldn't look so concerned if you weren't, he muttered viciously. Where are you going? I demanded when he marched for the door. Where do you think? I need to see this witch. What's her name? You're not going to track her down right now, and what, take a look at the back of her neck. I rushed to block him from leaving his apartment. He snarled, and I rumbled right back shoving him away. Get a hold of yourself. We're at the academy, and you're a damn professor. You can't go around terrorizing students that might bear that mark. His nostrils flared, his fists shaking with fury clenched at his sides. Move. No. Why are you protecting her? She might be one of them. And? It's no longer against the law, remember? It is for her to be here. He went for the door again when I grabbed him by his shirt, spun him around, and slammed him into the wall. Let go of me, he shouted. Why? So you can do something stupid. Get control of yourself. You should be helping me, he argued and hissed, tilting his head while his eyes narrowed. Don't tell me you're blinded by her good looks. Shit, she's already charmed you. I shoved him harder into the wall. Is that what you think? Why else wouldn't you want to know the truth? I let him go, wishing I hadn't come here tonight. I'll deal with it, all right? I'll find out for sure, and then we can figure out what to do. Tell me her name, if nothing else. You are not going to track her down and terrorize her. She's timid enough as it is, I warned. I won't allow it. He bared his fangs, squaring his shoulders. You don't control me. Maybe not, but I'm the friend who's been by your side through everything. I'm the one who helped you get hold of your temper, and stopped you from losing your mind. We might not be from the same house, but we're brothers. Do you not trust me anymore? His jaw worked back and forth, and he bared his fangs with a quiet hiss. Not when a witch bearing that mark is involved. I'm sorry. Without another word, I made for the door, yanked it open, and left. He called to me, but I slammed the door shut and stormed to my apartment. What had I been thinking? I, better than most, knew how unstable Gentry was. I never should have said anything, but it was too late to take it back now. All I could do was find a way to prove I hadn't seen the mark, 
or keep Gentry away from Emery all semester. No matter what I told him, until he had his own proof, he'd stalk her like she was the enemy, no matter if she was merely an innocent bystander. Furious at my stupidity, I cursed and punched the wall. If I'd kept my curiosities to myself and not tracked her down, she wouldn't be in danger of dealing with a pissed-off vampire. So much for this semester being an easy one. Chapter 3 Gentry The sun set hours ago, but I didn't move from my place in the courtyard. It had been three days since Alistair told me about the witch with the birthmark, and for three days I'd been trying to figure out who she was. I'd been unable to follow Alistair around all day, in hopes he'd lead me to her. Our schedules conflicted too much. It was the first week back, and I had to keep up the appearance that I wasn't stalking a potential threat on campus. Alistair had tried to talk to me again, but I ignored him. If he didn't want me involved, he never should have told me. I couldn't leave the issue alone, even if I wanted to. The memories of those I'd lost haunted me. If I let a necromancer roam free on this campus, putting the students and faculty at risk, it'd come back to bite me in the ass. The last time he had come to talk to me, I managed to swipe the attendance sheet from his bag when he wasn't looking. Every student had checked out except for one. I was down to searching for the last witch. Emery Dupree. I almost went straight to her dorm room, but couldn't think of a convincing excuse for why I was there. I wasn't in any of her classes, and I wasn't her professor. And if she did bear the mark and was indeed a threat, the last thing I wanted was for her to know someone was onto her. I rested my shoulder against the stone column of the breezeway, listening to everyone that walked by. Emery. I was listening for a witch named Emery. Several passing students gave me odd looks. I hissed and they scurried off. Around 10, I considered giving up and picking this up again tomorrow afternoon when someone said her name. I tilted my head pinpointing the voice and followed. You're always in the damn library, the woman with brown hair complained to the black-haired one beside her. Come out with us all. It's Friday night. And? And you need to learn to live a little. Please? I don't like crowds you know that. Can you go without me and not make this a big deal? The brunette sighed. You're killing me, Emery. The whole point of coming here was to experience life outside our tiny little community, remember? Not so you could find somewhere new to hide. No, it wasn't, and you know it. Stop trying to guilt trip me because I don't want to be your wing woman. And maybe I like hiding. It's safer. Go have fun. I'll see you in the morning. Her words and the edge to her voice piqued my suspicions even more. Emery parted from her friend and headed to the library. Keeping her in my sights, I took the same path, attempting to get a sense of what she was, aside from a witch. Cinnamon mixed with a hint of apples and something sweeter teased my nose. The necromancers I'd encountered before all had a coldness about them. I was cold by nature, but this cold was different. It was biting and alive. Dealing with death, using spirits as their weapons, had made them heartless. They were cruel by nature, and that kind of darkness left its mark on the soul and the magic within. I sensed none of that from this Emery yet. Then again, she could be quite well at covering it up. I was sure they'd come up with new ways to cloak their magic after so many years of living in hiding. Emery turned into the library. I hung back a minute and went in after her entering casually, and not like I was stalking someone. The lingering trail of cinnamon told me where to go. I peered through the stacks, catching a glimpse of long black hair whipping around a shelf. She muttered under her breath, but the words were lost to me. I stayed a few shelves behind, making sure she was in sight. Damn it, she cursed, and I stilled. Why can't I just miraculously find that one book? Frowning, I attempted to peek through the leather-bound volumes and shelves to see what she was talking about, but she was already walking away, a stack of texts in her arms. She paused at the end of a corridor, her brow furrowing. After another curse, she headed down it, and I had no choice but to wait for her in the main room. There were no doors at the other end of that corridor, 
and it was a very tiny room. I didn't want her to spot me, not yet. Less than ten minutes later, footsteps headed my way. I ducked out of sight at the last second. She had another book in her hands and trudged upstairs. On the fourth floor, she turned off the staircase and weaved her way to an incredibly old part of the library most students didn't venture into. They complained it was always too cold and dark, and swore up and down it was haunted. The campus was cleansed once a month to clear out negative or spiritual energy. That didn't mean some spirits didn't decide to linger or had no choice but to stick around. Emery turned down another corridor that ended in a tiny study room. I stayed at the end, listening to her talk quietly to herself while setting books and flipping pages in a notebook. Her pen scratched across a page. The seconds turning to minutes. No one joined her, and midnight quickly came and went. I kept vigil at the end of the corridor, staying in the shadows, listening. A book slammed shut around half past twelve, and her steps headed my way. I ducked into the stacks behind me, watching her pass. Her black hair had been pulled up in a clip, and she fiddled with the charm hanging from a black chain around her neck. She tilted her head while her eyes narrowed, almost like she was listening to something. Whatever it was, had to be in her head. I heard nothing. She puffed out her cheeks, muttered a complaint about too many damn stairs, and walked away. Figuring this was my chance, I blurred into the room she'd vacated and leaned over a table filled with books, notebooks covered in messy notes, and her black tote bag. Her notes were written in slanted cursive that was so damn small my eyes hurt trying to read it. I skimmed over it quickly, but nothing worrisome stood out. I dropped the first notebook and picked up the second. Here there were more randomly jotted notes, messy little sketches in the margins, and a lot of question marks. What was she looking for? Several symbols accompanied them. They teased my memories, but I couldn't place them. Not finding anything useful in that notebook either, I tried to check her tote bag. Gah. Damn, I snapped with a hiss when her bag shocked my fingers. Protection spell. What are you hiding in there? Unable to move the bag, all I could do was bend down and try to peer inside. Something with a leather cover was tucked to the right, but what it was remained a mystery. Taking a moment to listen and ensure she wasn't coming back yet, I sat on the couch and checked the books she'd pulled from the shelves. The first few were nothing more than histories of magic and the witch covens about today. I rolled my eyes. This reading was all probably Alistair's doing. He did tend to think every single answer resided in a book with ungodly small print. A few more were about specific types of magic. There was a book on divination, but it was the last one I uncovered that had my hand shaking. Necromancy, I whispered. I glared at the offending cover of the book. Why was Emery researching necromancy? The book appeared to be nothing more than a historical reference, but none of the professors went into depth on the subject. No one had since the feuds that broke out over a century ago. So, why are you looking into it? I mused, unable to keep the angry hiss from my words. The birthmark and this. Who are you? She hadn't written down any notes on necromancy that I could see. The strong scent of cinnamon wafted across my nose, and with a muffled grunt of annoyance, I blurred from the small study room. Back in the main room, I searched for any sign of her, but she wasn't around. There were no footsteps, either. Yeah, I see it, her voice came from a few stacks over. I stepped out of sight in a hurry. She continued, not what I need though. There's got to be something here. I toyed with the idea that perhaps Emery was a bit unstable in the head if she was having full conversations with herself. Not like she could be talking on a cell phone. What Henry? Henry. Who was Henry? Curiosity peaked, and wondering how I could have missed realizing someone else was suddenly with her, I inched closer. I was only two aisles away when a thud came from behind me. A book lay on the floor. I jerked around in time to see a second heavy book topple off the shelf and land next to it. A quick glance about told me there was no one there. Haunted indeed, I mumbled and bent to pick the books up. The moment I crouched down to grab them, the smell of cinnamon mixed with that something sweet I couldn't quite pinpoint yet surrounded me. 
abandoning the books when footsteps came from only one aisle over, I blurred around the end of the shelves. And ran right into Emery. Damn sorry, she exclaimed, grabbing hold of my arm the same time I snagged hers to stop her from falling over. I ended up dragging her into my chest. Her cheeks flushed, and a nervous laugh escaped her lips. You're like a freaking wall. Sorry. I mean very solid. Very, very solid. She tugged on the silver charm of a raven hanging from her neck, face turning a darker shade of red under my gaze. Yeah, that came out weird. Sorry. About running into you. Happens. I hadn't let her arm go yet, and she didn't try to take it back. A pair of curious dark green eyes stared up at me beneath a swath of ebony hair that fell free of her clip, eyes that immediately sucked me in like quicksand. There was no fear of never getting free, a strange comfort my mind failed to understand. The curves of her face were soft and delicate, but there was a hardness beneath that gaze. She'd seen horrible things in her life so far, and they left their mark. The sadness and fear Alistair mentioned were impossible to miss. A brush of guilt, at my immediate hatred for her, based on a birthmark almost made me let her arm go and back away. The guilt was drowned out by a furious hiss inside my head. Whatever she'd suffered through meant nothing. If she was touched by death magic, she had no right to be here. You okay in there? She asked, abruptly sounding genuinely worried. You look a bit lost in thought. I frowned, I'm fine. Her slightly narrowed gaze said she didn't believe me. Yeah, sure. Why would you talk to a total stranger if you had problems? Her eyes widened. She gave her head a little shake as if unsure at her own words. She moved back, and I reluctantly let go of her arm. Where are you going? I asked while she walked away. She paused. Back to my studying. Yeah, right, studying. She was a few more steps away when I blurted, Are you up here all by yourself? Seems kind of lonely. Her shoulders hunched when she hung her head, seemingly studying the hardwood floor. She shuffled her feet but said nothing. I needed a way in, something that would help me understand who she was and if she was a threat. I didn't catch your name, I said, needing her to stick around for a few more seconds. She fiddled with her charm necklace so much, I expected the black chain to snap at any moment. This time, she looked at me at least. I know. A hint of fear flashed through her eyes and she sucked in a deep breath, let it out and left me standing in the shelves alone. I shook my head and told myself to do what I came here to do. When she was about to duck into the corridor, I blurred by her back, and the few hairs covering her neck fluttered out of the way. I zeroed in on the black iris tattoo and the spot beneath it. There was no birthmark from what I could see. It wasn't until I was on the main floor of the library and out the doors, not wanting to stop until I was far away from Emery, that I noticed the cold. As a vampire, I was used to cold, but this was different. This cold seeped into my bones and sent a shiver rushing through me. I hadn't shivered since I was human. What bothered me more was the lack of a birthmark on her neck. Alistair wouldn't have come to me and appeared so worried if he hadn't seen it. The witch probably covered it up with makeup or some sort of illusion spell. The tattoo I had seen bothered me though. I set out to find Alistair, pondering over the black iris when I reached the main foyer. Lost in thought about the tattoo and the brush of cold that had stayed with me, I aimlessly glanced over the wall of portraits. When I reached the top row, I skidded to a stop, my boots squeaking harshly against the stones. No, she can't be. The dark green eyes of Emily Dravosh, third headmistress of WMA, looked out over the foyer and there on her left hand was a black iris tattoo. The tattoo, the green eyes, and her name, or at least her initials, all came back to Emily Dravush. I left the foyer in a hurry, blurring to Alistair's apartment to find a note on his door saying if anyone needed him, he was in the orchards, studying the stars. Cursing, I spun around and blurred out of the building, through the gates and into the rows of apple trees. The scent transported me back to the library and Emery. It meant something, her scent being so prevalent with the cinnamon, but with my mind racing, I couldn't slow long enough to put it together. Gentry. I turned to the right and spotted Alistair. 
He stood behind a large telescope aimed at the constellations to the right of the crescent-shaped moon. We need to talk. If this is about the witch again, I don't want to hear it. I told you to leave her alone. Emery Dupree, you mean? He hung his head, hissing. Why can't you let this go? If you asked me, I would have told you I haven't seen the birthmark since that day. It's probably not there. I didn't see it either. Wait, you looked at her neck? Are you stalking her? No. I might have followed her to the library where she ran into me to be fair, I added when he cursed. I didn't do anything to her, if that's what you're worried about. If there's no birthmark, then you can leave her be. Tell me honestly, when you spoke to her those few times, did you ever sense anything odd about her? Anything that shouldn't be there? Alistair rubbed his forehead, not answering me right away. His hesitation was all I needed. You felt it too, didn't you? I felt nothing all right, he snapped. You're lying. There's a coldness to her, the same coldness I felt all those years ago. I didn't feel cold but, he said, scowling at the stars, there's a heaviness to her magic. She's strong, that's all I sensed. He rubbed a hand down his face, asking, you're sure it's the same coldness? That was over a century ago. And? I snarled. It's not something I'm going to simply forget. I stomped from one tree to the next, snatching at the leaves when they got in the way. There's more. Like what? Her tattoo, it matches the one Emily Dravosh has on her hand. The black iris. It's a tattoo. You know how many people in the world probably have one? What about her green eyes? The fact that they're the same shade, or that her initials match? Alistair barked a laugh, and I glared. Do you have any idea how paranoid you sound right now? Eye color and matching initials. It's not a crime to have green eyes, or the same initials, or even the same tattoo. I growled. He moved to stand right in front of me. You're not giving me anything solid to go on here. Nothing. You need to stop letting your emotions get in the way, before you do something you can't take back. She's studying the origins of magic. He rolled his eyes skyward. So are half the students here. And necromancy. He opened his mouth but snapped it shut. You're sure? I saw the book with her things. She had pages of notes with weird sigils and symbols on them and question marks, things I know I've seen somewhere before. And she was talking to someone named Henry in the library, but there was no one there. He backed off, shoving his hands in his pockets, a contemplative look in his eyes. She might not be as bad as I think, but she's up to something. Every instinct I have is telling me she's trouble. It's still not solid proof of anything, Alistair said quietly. Any student can access any book in the library. Nothing's off limits here. Look at me and tell me you don't think something's up with her. Alistair faced me, the doubt easy to spot. You could be wrong. I could be, but what if I'm not? You could simply ask her. I scoffed. Yeah, because if she is touched by death magic, she's going to admit it to a vampire. You never know. Either way, you should back off. I scoffed. And why's that? You're not exactly known for being subtle or sociable, for that matter. How do you plan on getting her to tell you anything? I can be sociable. Couldn't I? Maybe. I'm your only friend here for a reason. I'm the only one who knows your resting asshole face is just that. You scare people off. Not her. I said quietly, looking back toward the campus. She seemed worried about me. Why? I don't know. It was odd. I ran my hands through my hair, messing it up even more. I did see the fear you mentioned, smelled it on her, but it was faint. She seemed to be arguing with herself about something. What she felt didn't matter. I picked at another leaf hanging from a branch and tore it to shreds. Seeing her concern threw me a bit. There she'd been, alone and clearly afraid of something, and she asked if I was all right. She was a curious witch, that was damn sure. I let the bits of leaf fall to the ground and stepped over them. I'll get her to tell me the truth. All of it. 
Gentry, Alistair started, but didn't finish whatever lecture he'd been about to give me. His eyes flared red. He tucked his hands in his pockets. Whatever. I need a drink. We can talk about this more inside. I could use a shot of whiskey and blood too, but I wasn't sure I was in the mood to share one with him tonight. We were almost to the gate leading inside the courtyard when I paused, sniffing the air. Blood. Fresh too. I took another sniff. Alistair hissed. We turned to the right and took off into the darkness, following the stench of gore and the decadence of fresh blood. When we passed the corner of the wall, the smell overwhelmed me. My fangs protruded when I spotted the body lying face down in the grass and a pile of leaves. Alistair rolled the person over and staggered back when the head rolled free and came to a rest at his feet. Professor Dolan. The vampire's mouth was frozen open in a silent scream. His fangs had been yanked from his gums and his eyes plucked from his head. The body was sliced right down the middle, his blood in a pool soaking into the soil. I examined the wound closely. The edges of his skin were torn, not cut with a blade. Alistair said he was going to alert the faculty. I said I'd stay with the body. After he blurred away, I turned my attention back to the corpse, searching for any clue about who had killed him. He'd been a well-liked professor as far as I knew. This death hadn't been a kind one. He'd suffered. I sensed no magic near the wounds, nor did I see a weapon close by. That'd be too easy. Having night vision made it easier to study the blood spatter and footprints. From what I could gather, Dolan's prints were the only ones present. Strange, I muttered. When I went to stand, a dark spot amongst the leaves caught my eye. It wasn't blood. I reached down and carefully picked it up. A black flower petal. It crumbled in my hand and blew away, not giving me a chance to figure out what kind it was. Guess this semester is about to get even more interesting. Chapter 4 Emery I triple-checked the back of my neck in the bathroom mirror every morning now, ensuring the illusion held. Rose had run up to me on our first day of classes and whispered that my mark was visible. After freaking out and wondering how many people saw it, I had to ramp up my illusion spells for my neck and my arm. The influence of surrounding magic had probably made my traditional charms wear off too quickly. Using makeup never worked. The markings were too strong and shone through whatever I put on them. The first week of classes passed in a strange blur, and the second went by almost as fast. A rumor had gone around campus that a dead body had been found, but the faculty quickly squashed the idea and scolded the students about spreading misinformation. Professor Dolan, the vampire who someone said was dead, had apparently taken a few months sabbatical. I had no idea who he was, but his classes were taken over by several other professors. The staff did seem a bit out of sorts since that day. Alistair kept his distance now. His eyes never landed on me during his lectures, and he avoided me during our magical theory class. I wasn't sure what to think of it, but I decided it was probably for the best. Being around so many vampires made it more challenging than I thought to control my irrational fear of anything with fangs. I stayed out of the gossip circles about the dead vampire, no matter how hard Rose tried to pull me into them. When I saw her, which seemed to be hardly ever, She'd made quite the impression on several shifters and witches alike. She spent most of her time bouncing from one study group to the next, or going out to the nightlife in Burning Glade. She begged me to go with her, but I was content to stay on campus and away from crowds. A few people attempted to make friends with me, but after Alistair's weird rejection, I made it clear I was a loner and liked it that way. Besides, being alone made it easier to deal with the number of spirits I encountered daily. None of them were stuck here like the woman in the black gown had been, but they sensed me as I did them. They were drawn to me. Though I might have appeared like I was alone, I never really was. October came blustery and cold. The leaves turned, showcasing the warm colors of autumn. I strolled across the courtyard, picked up a few red and orange ones, tucked them in the pages of my book, and hummed on my way to the library. A few times I sensed eyes on me, 
but the students out this early in the morning weren't paying attention to me. Ignoring the weird feeling, I walked faster and ducked into the expansive five-story library, which included an astronomy tower. After snagging a coffee from the cart on the main level, I took the wide centrally located stairs to the next floor. I weaved through stacks and shelves to find the next set of narrower stairs. On the fourth floor was a small sitting area, tucked away down a dimly lit passage. Inside it was an oversized coffee table, a few armchairs, a couch, and a hearth with a fire that never burned out. Two windows flanked it, giving with a perfect view of the mountains and the sunrise. I'd never come across anyone else in this room, luckily. I plopped down on the comfy leather couch, spread my books on the table, and dug into my studies. I was working through some intricate work involving higher-level spells when a ghostly hand appeared to my right. Hum. The hand belonging to a spirit named Henry. He motioned to the small book of intentions I had open on the table. He was a witch and had been a professor here about a hundred years ago and one of the few spirits who interacted with me directly. I sensed he missed teaching. I wasn't going to complain about the extra help. What about it? Didn't I include that in the spell? He shook his head his long white hair floating around his head like he was underwater. This time, only his arm and head had manifested. The last time he was full-bodied, he'd sucked the warmth from the entire room and left me freezing. Thoughtfully, he didn't do that today. He motioned to the page again. You're right. That would have been a disaster of a spell. I'd used the wrong count and would have thrown everything off. I sighed, crossed out what I had, and decided burning it and starting over on a clean piece of paper might be better. With the ruined spell tossed into the hearth, I sat back down and reworked it. Henry grinned when I did it correctly this time. You know, it's not really the spells I'm after. Though he had no eyes, his brows worked fine and rose in question. I need to understand it more, I whispered. These spells aren't going to help me with the other half of my magical path. Find anything yet? That last book wasn't as helpful as we thought it would be. Asking anyone here about death magic would have been beyond risky, anyone who wasn't a spirit, at least. It wasn't like I could hide what I was from spirits. Being sensitive to them wasn't rare, but my magic made me a beacon to the spirit world and those in it. I'd asked Henry and a few others who'd been here a long time if they knew of anything in the library that might give me answers. Being raised among witches meant my magic was strong. But understanding my death magic was difficult when I was the only one in the coven with it. My parents hadn't been touched by it. My grandmother had, but she was killed before I was born. Seeking out someone like me was too dangerous. Even after the ban was lifted, no one wanted to come out in the open and announce to the world what they were. I didn't blame them either, but the more powerful my base magic became, the stronger my death magic would be. The notion of not being in control made me apprehensive about what my future would bring. Henry glanced at the floor and held up three fingers. On the third floor, you found three things. He held up two fingers but shook his head. This told me he might have found something but wasn't sure yet. I was tempted to have him take me to those items now, but I had quite a bit of work to get through. Flunking out my first semester would not help me find any answers. Halfway through the day my eyes drooped and I yawned. I told Henry I'd be back after I grabbed more coffee. But when I returned to the room, it wasn't Henry they first saw from the doorway. The vampire with the brown eyes and solid chest sat on the couch I'd been using all morning. His messy black hair made him look a lot younger than I sensed he was. His shoulders were broad, and he stretched his arms across the back of the couch. He had a lock of pure white hair on the right side of his face, and brown eyes that were so dark they were nearly black. Books that weren't mine were splayed on the table and the couch cushion beside him. He had a notebook on his lap, and a pen in his hand. Something about his completely laid-back demeanor made me jealous. I couldn't think of a single time I'd been that relaxed. He seemed to be in a better state of mind than he was the first time we met. Too bad I wasn't. And goddess, he was handsome. My cheeks and neck burned, and I wondered if it was too late to turn tail and pretend I hadn't come back yet. 
I'm going to guess you're the owner of these, he said, motioning to the books on the table without glancing up. Damn vampire hearing. Of course he heard my footsteps. Yeah. You're the first one I've seen in this room. He'd neatly stacked some of my closed books and shifted everything to the other side of the table. Had he gone through my notebooks at all? My gaze darted to my tote bag resting in the armchair. Shit. My journals were in there. Had he looked through those? No, there was a protection spell. They should be safe. Didn't mean to upset you, he said quickly, setting his notebook aside and rising from the couch. I didn't look through anything, I promise. I honestly thought I was the only one who knew about this room. Guess we kept missing each other. He held out his hand and a smile that seemed out of place graced his face. Gentry Wilson. I mulled over whether I should tell him my name, but what was the harm? Not like it was my real one. Emery Dupree, I said, shaking his cold hand. Wondered if I'd see you again. He tilted his head, studying me. Is that because you wanted to see me again? Maybe run into my wall of a chest again? I cringed. He laughed but like his smile it sounded forced. It is a nice chest, I said, and his brow arched. Wow, sorry. I didn't mean to say that. I stepped back and sat down on the chair while he resumed his seat on the couch. Getting up and leaving sounded like a great idea, but for some reason, my body didn't want to respond. So did you? He asked. Did I what? Want to see me again? I was honestly starting to think I imagined you, I admitted, pulling my feet up under me after I kicked off my slip-on sneakers. An amused glint appeared in those brown eyes that seemed more genuine than anything else he'd done so far. You do that a lot. Imagine people into existence, he asked a bit teasingly. Happens when you're alone a lot, I whispered and picked up my notebook, wondering why I let that little bit slip out. What was going on with me today? It was only the second time I'd encountered this guy, and my brain was muddled. Deciding leaving would be safer, I gathered up my papers and tucked them in my tote. What are you doing? he asked. I'm giving you the room. It's fine, really. I'm a bit off today, and things are coming out of my mouth that I don't entirely understand, and I'm making it worse. I tugged on the raven hanging from my necklace, quietly scolding myself to simply stay quiet. It was nice to meet you, Gentry Wilson. Emery, you can stay. You were here first, after all, and I wouldn't mind some good company. I'm not exactly known for being that. I noticed you tend to keep to yourself, he mentioned, causing me to pause in the middle of shoving more books in my tote. You never seem to talk much to anyone. Except you, apparently. I shoved another notebook in my bag, then stilled. How would you know that? Have you been watching me? No idea what you're talking about. Bullshit. I dropped my bag in the chair, my aggravation overriding the bit of unease that came whenever I was near a vampire. The realization that I hardly felt any anxiety around Gentry was puzzling, but not the point right then. I knew someone was watching me these last few days. If you wanted to talk to me again, why didn't you just do it? Or do you like to randomly watch others on campus? He didn't even have the decency to deny it or look ashamed he did it in the first place. I have my reasons. And those are what? You're a creeper? I picked up my bag and made for the door. Whatever. Keep the study room. I'll find another place to hang out. A couple of steps from the door, I blinked. Gentry stood in front of me. I flinched with a curse while my hand fisted at my side. What is it with you vampires? Trying to give me a heart attack. He gave me a questioning look, shaking his head. I didn't mean to upset you or anything. You're a, you're not the only one who has a hard time talking to people. To anyone, really. Why do I find that hard to believe? You can believe what you want, but it's true. He rubbed the back of his neck like he was nervous. I'm not going to lie, after our first encounter, I've been a bit entranced by you but I wasn't sure how to talk to you again. I'm known to be a loner myself. 
Aren't you the next in line for your throne? I asked. Gulsun, that's the same last name as the Prince of the House of the Red Moon. I thought you'd be used to talking to others. Or being around them, at least. Part of the reason why I'm not. It's not always fun being in the spotlight. Hard to be yourself. You have no idea. The second the words were out of my mouth, I wanted to kick myself. What was wrong with me? I rubbed my forehead, sensing the temperature change in the room and tried not to show it. If Gentry noticed, he kept it to himself. Henry manifested behind the vampire. I sensed the ghost's curiosity about him, and he kept motioning from me to him and smiling. I rolled my eyes, wanting to tell the spirit to leave it be, but he kept doing it. Gentry looked from me to behind him and back again. Emery? Ha. Huh. You okay? Yeah, I'm great. And I'm sorry that you're having a hard go of it, but like I said, I'm not particularly good company. We don't have to talk or anything. We can simply study together in silence. Why? He rocked back on his heels, his lips screwing to the side. Loners have to stick together. That, and it'd honestly get my one friend off my back if he knew I was hanging out with someone other than him all the time. I scoffed, musing, your friend sounds like my cousin. Listen, it's fine. I didn't mean to upset you or anything. You can have the room. He moved to step around me, when Henry manifested fully behind him and gave him a push. Gentry stumbled into me. In a blur he spun us around, and I landed on top of him when we hit the floor. His chest caught my fall. Our eyes met, and we burst out laughing, breaking the tension that had grown between us. Sorry, not usually a klutz, he said, seeming in no hurry to move. For some reason I wasn't either. I am. This is probably my fault somehow. He lifted his hand, running his fingers through the long strands of hair hanging by his face. Despite the heavy chill in the air from Henry stealing all the energy from the room, my face burned hot. Gentry cleared his throat and helped me sit up. Right, I was leaving. I'll see you around. Gentry wait, I said, not sure why Henry thought this was a good idea or what I was even doing, but Rose would never let me live it down if I passed up on finding at least one friend while I was here. And he was right, we loners should stick together. At least he might understand my quietness. We can study together if you want. You're sure? Yeah, no reason not to. I unpacked my things, settled into the armchair, threw my legs over the side, and dug back into my work. Gentry did the same on the couch. The silence wasn't awkward like I thought it would be. When I ran out of coffee, he told me to stay put. Less than three minutes later, he was back with two fresh cups. Thanks. Going to need it, if I'm going to make it through my classes tonight. How many are you taking this semester? Six. No, check that. Seven. Most first years take three, he said, chuckling. What can I say? I like to read and study. And it gives you an excuse to be antisocial, if you're always doing schoolwork, he added, already looking down at the book he had open on his lap. His eyes flicked to me, a smile appearing on his lips for the length of a heartbeat. I get it. That was partly my reasoning. The other was I had no idea if my time here would last. I wanted to absorb as much as I could, on the off chance I was discovered and removed. What are you taking if you don't mind me asking? Advanced magical theory, I told him. Two history courses, our biology course, practical application and advanced spells and potions. That's a heavy workload. Which is why this room is about to become my second home. So if I can't find you, look here. I'll keep that in mind. A nervous smile spread across my face. I turned away, playing with my necklace and attempting to get back to my book. What about you? I asked, after five minutes of reading the same sentence. My brain failed to focus on anything but the vampire sharing the room with me. What are you taking? Going to guess, this isn't your first time here. Fifth actually, though I come here in spurts. Two years there, five here, he replied. This time around I'm mostly teaching, a couple of history courses. 
One involves the lore of the races, and the other deals with the more violent aspect of our history. The feuds between covens and whatnot. How the Eternal Ember came to be. Sounds exciting. I think I have those on my schedule for the spring semester. Maybe you'll be in my classes then, he said with a small smile. I'm also taking two training courses. Hand to hand, I mean, as well as warding and protection against magic. It'll be a while before the prince of my coven is ready to retire. I figure I'll join our guard at some point. I'd seen groups of students out on the grounds, sparring and training in various uses of weapons, magical and physical. Gentry certainly had the right build for a fighter. When our eyes met this time, a dangerous gleam appeared in the depths of his brown irises. The intensity startled me, but I blinked and it was gone. A flood of memories from a night I longed to forget cascaded through my thoughts. My hand went to my right side, a phantom pain causing me to flinch. Emery? Gentry's voice broke through the haze. I was at the academy, and there wasn't a pack of bloodthirsty vampires trying to kill me, only one vampire who had been nothing but polite so far. Sorry, I think you'll do well in the guard I mean. I have no idea what I'm going to do once I'm out of here. His brown eyes darkened, but if he noticed my weird moment he kept it to himself. I'm sure something will come to you. Could work with the ember. They always need fresh blood. Fresh blood. I bit back a smile at the pun. Government was never really my thing. I'll come up with something eventually. We fell back into our comfortable silence for a while, until he closed his books and stood, stretching his arms over his head. It was impossible not to admire his physique through the tight red shirt. He moved slowly around the room, tossed a few more logs onto the fire. The orange and red light danced in his dark eyes, and I tugged absently on my necklace. Another glance at those brown eyes had my heart fluttering. I was in trouble. Big heaps of trouble. The gleam I caught earlier should have been enough to tell me Gentry was probably bad news. Even if he wasn't, how was I supposed to get close to him when I couldn't tell him who I really was? I fought the urge to rub my right arm and directed my gaze back to the notebook in my hand. Gentry did something to me, made me not feel so erratic and afraid, as strange as that sounded. No matter what he made me feel, getting comfortable around him would only lead to trouble. Chapter 5 Emery Over the weekend and into the following week, when I was in the study room at the library, Gentry joined me. Seeing his head of messy hair was a pleasant surprise that I quickly grew used to. If he wasn't there before me, it didn't take long for him to arrive. Our class schedules were almost identical, which meant we could spend a lot of time together. Most of those moments were quiet, but having him around was comfortable. I kept telling myself to stop this before went any further. I couldn't. The idea of not seeing Gentry during the day bothered me. Having the vampire around did make it a bit difficult the days. Henry was very insistent on relaying messages or when other spirits decided to pop in. Henry was still on the hunt for books that might help me. So far the few he had found weren't what I was looking for, not entirely. My confidence in finding answers dropped with every disappointment, but then Gentry would appear, and I found myself becoming optimistic. Rose would have been jealous if I ever told her about him. Now, if I wanted to talk to Henry, I simply had to mumble something about finding a book and disappear for a few minutes. The few times Gentry and I did have conversations, they were mostly about our classes. He helped me with a few of my assignments, but neither of us really talked about ourselves. He'd been right in thinking we were similar. He didn't pry into my life and vice versa. Every now and then, I spotted him peeking at the scar on my neck. So far he kept his thoughts to himself and I appreciated not having to explain my not-so-joyful past. What are you happy about? Gentry asked one evening during our nightly study sessions. It had been a long day of lessons. I was beyond exhausted, but had to get a paper written by the next day. He offered to stay and keep me company and bring me coffee. Nothing. Liar, he teased. Must be good. Yeah? 
How can you tell? Your eyes shimmer when you're happy, he commented, and my pen paused on the notebook page. And you stop fiddling with your necklace. How observant of you, I replied, unable to look away from his eyes. So, what is it that has Emery Dupree in such a good mood when she's swamped with classwork? I cleared my throat roughly and scribbled in the margins of my notebook, finally able to tear my gaze from his. I was thinking about stuff. Stuff? he asked, and I heard the amusement in his voice. Quite specific. I thought so. Come on, you can tell me. Not like it's bad if it's got you smiling. I shrugged, tapping my pen on my notebook. I've been enjoying this. Hanging out. It's been nice. He grinned, resituating himself in the armchair. Me too. Really? Why do you sound so surprised? Perhaps you're not as bad of company as you think. Maybe, or you really enjoy bad company. He rolled his eyes. Closing the book he'd been reading for the last hour, he set it on the table and sat forward. There's a party every year on Halloween. Usually, I don't go, but if you were interested, I wondered if we might go together. Like a date? I asked quietly, my heart racing, and I knew the minute he heard it. Damn vampire. He smirked, his eyes shimmering with laughter and excitement. Exactly. You can say no if you want, obviously. Sounds fun? Great. I look forward to it. He checked the old wooden clock above the mantelpiece and stood. I have a few things to take care of before turning in. See you tomorrow, M. I chuckled at the nickname, watching him gather up his things. Later, General. He winked at the door and blurred out of sight. Gentry winking. That was not something I expected from him. My mind wandered to what this party would entail and how ecstatic Rose would be that I had a date for it. On second thought, maybe I wouldn't tell her. I eventually finished most of my paper, decided I'd do the rest of it first thing in the morning, and left the library. Unlike a human campus where at four in the morning most of the students were asleep, WMA was bustling. Witches and shifters weren't strictly nocturnal, but shifters shifting worked better beneath the moonlight, and our magic tended to as well. I stifled a yawn and considered swinging by the dining hall to grab a sandwich to go when someone fell in step to my right. Emery. I scowled at Alistair, who was now walking beside me. Oh, I'm sorry, do I know you? Don't do that. Do what? Ignore you? Oh wait, are you the only one that gets to ignore someone? He touched my arm, bringing us to a stop on the sidewalk. He tugged me out of the way of others walking by, his brow furrowed and his pale eyes narrowed. Why are you angry? I opened my mouth to tell him exactly why, but shut it quickly. I had no idea why I was so annoyed with him, for appearing interested in me one day and completely avoiding me the next. We talked what three times? I don't know, I admitted. But to be fair, you're the one that talked to me first. I just thought, I said but shook my head inside. Never mind. What do you want? You need to stay away from Gentry Wilson. I'm sorry what? How do you even know I've been hanging out with him? Doesn't matter. Are you following me or something? I demanded. So you try to befriend me, then you pretend I don't exist, but the second another guy decides I'm worth his time, you want me to stay away from him. Did I get that right? Emery? No, I snapped. Don't Emery me. You don't know me. You don't get to order me around. I'm looking out for you. Why? Why do you suddenly care who I hang out with? You made it damn obvious you changed your mind about our possibly becoming friends. Unless you're jealous. Is that what this? Some weird jealous vampire macho shit. No. Look, he said and grabbed my right arm when I attempted to walk away. I flinched at the contact the tattoos on my arm moving at his presence. He let go but his eyes kept darting to my arm. Gentry is trouble, all right? I don't want you to get hurt. Is that so hard to believe? It is when you don't know me. And how would you know, huh? 
Gentry's been nothing but a friend to me. We're even going to the Halloween party, together. This side of him, it's not him, at least not all of him. He growled quietly, glancing at something behind me. I turned to look, but there was no one there except for a group of witches talking excitedly. And I'm sorry about avoiding you. There's been a lot going on, and I've been distracted. My workload increased exponentially. Why? I asked quietly. His eyes darkened when his eyes moved away from me. Wait, does this have to do with Professor Dolan and his sudden leaving? Alistair shoved his hands in the pockets of his black slacks while his eye twitched. Yes. I took over one of his classes. Isn't a sabbatical a bit more planned? Usually. Aha, uh -huh, I mused. And these rumors going around that he was murdered, it has nothing to do with them being real, does it? Just rumors. I hefted my tote bag higher up my shoulder, studying him. Then why are you so agitated? I'm not. Yeah, you are. You're not the only observant one around here. Your lectures have been a bit stiff since those rumors started. He gave me a blank look, turned and walked away. No, you don't get to that to me, I yelled, hurrying to catch up. I snagged his arm, not letting him blur away from me. What's going on around here? If Dolan was murdered, the students have a right to know. He wasn't murdered, he said with a hiss. Just stay away from Gentry. That's all I wanted to tell you. You're freaking ridiculous, you know that? His angry retort was cut off by a high-pitched scream coming from across the gardens. Chapter 6 Alistair Talking to Emery had been a bad idea, but I needed to warn her about Gentry's plans. He might be acting as her friend now, but eventually he'd grow impatient. The nice guy persona he put on would disappear in a blink, and Emery would be left to deal with the brunt of his anger. The sound of a scream cut through our disagreement. Emery and I turned toward the commotion. It came from the direction the group of witches had gone. Leaving Emery to catch up, I blurred through the gardens to where the witches were huddled together, eyes wide, while they pointed and attempted to tell me what they'd found. Shit. I hissed at the dead and mutilated body, tucked away behind one of the trellised honeysuckle plants. The head rested a foot away, fangs and eyes missing, exactly like Professor Dolan's corpse. The body had been cut open, too. Her blood soaked the ground around her in a wide lopsided circle. A quick peek inside her chest cavity was all I needed to know her heart had been ripped out. More screams and horrified cries surrounded me. I jerked upward, searching for any members of faculty. A few professors had come running at the sound of the shrieks and helped push the students back. We needed to cordon off the courtyard entirely, until we could remove the body. So much for keeping Dolan's death a secret. I highly doubted we'd be able to pretend these witches hadn't found a murdered student. I stepped back from the body, glancing around for anything that might tell me what happened when I spotted Emery at the front of the crowd, mouth agape and brow creased. But she wasn't staring at the body. She stared at something beyond it. I know who did it, Jana, one of the witches who found the body, announced. She raised a shaky hand, pointing at the corpse. Can't you feel it? Can't you all feel it? We were warned this would happen. I scowled at the witch, inwardly sighing. She was the daughter of Clara Flanagan, a member of the Eternal Ember. She had probably been informed by her mother about the goings-on at the latest session, and the talks surrounding death magic. The last thing we needed on campus was mass panic. I motioned to one of the professors to get them away from the body, but the witch shouted over him. Don't you feel it? How can you all not feel it? She was murdered by death magic. There's a necromancer here, there has to be, she ranted, pulling away with the rest of the students. I'm telling you, we're not safe, none of us are safe. Someone with death magic killed that vampire. The remainder of the crowd dispersed to Jana's rambling shouts about necromancers coming to kill us all. I was ready to return my attention to the body when I spotted Emery once more. She'd paled considerably and gulped loud enough for me to hear. Her green eyes flicked to me. 
A heartbeat later she took off, nearly running out of the courtyard and inside. Close off the courtyard, Professor Julian Moore announced, hurrying over. He'd been at WMA for the last 20 years as a member of the staff, and was someone I considered a friend, despite our differences. His eyes glowed yellow, and he growled down at the body. Two murders. This can't be a coincidence. No it can't, I agreed. Headmistress Fairmain will want to call a staff meeting. If we have a murderer getting past the wards, they're either extraordinarily strong or we have a weak spot. Unless they're already here, I murmured. You think the witch is right? He asked, crouching over the body and sniffing loudly. You tell me. Do you smell death magic? Sense it at all? He shut his eyes, sniffing again, and shook his head. Blood is what I smell. Blood and death, but no magic. Not as if I've been around death magic much. Though we both know who has. No, I snarled. Julian's brow rose. Gentry's already on edge because of the first murder, I explained. And yet he's one of the few who would be able to sense such darkness, don't you think? Julian looked around the courtyard. Either way, we need to move the body out of sight. And send someone to speak to Jana. If she keeps ranting about necromancers being on campus, we're going to have a panic on our hands. I'll talk to her, he said, not sounding happy about it. Jana has always been an excitable one. As is her mother. One of the gurneys from the infirmary was wheeled outside. We wrapped the body and head in sheets, placed them on the bed, and quickly carted the dead vampire away from prying eyes. Two witches from the staff stayed behind to clear away the blood and cleanse the ground. Nothing would chase away the image that was surely going to be burned into those witches' minds. And Emery's. Why had she gone so pale? She'd been shocked when she first saw the body, but afterward, she looked terrified, almost as scared as she'd been the first night we ran into each other. Something had changed in those few seconds. Then it hit me. Jana had mentioned necromancers. Stop it, I growled to myself, alone in the corridor after the body was taken to the infirmary to be further examined. You sound as paranoid as Gentry. What about me? I gritted my teeth when Gentry himself appeared at the end of the hall. I assume you heard. The entire school knows by now, thanks to Jana. Julian was supposed to calm her down. Gentry barked a laugh. No one will get that witch to stop squealing. You know how she is once all eyes are on her. It's a trait she picked up from Clara. Obnoxious and loud, the lot of them. What about the body? Same as Dolan's. Were there any flower petals on the ground? Flower petals. I tried to remember, but nothing came to mind. She was found in the gardens. I'm sure there were some. Why are you asking? I found one by Dolan's body. Black. It fell apart in my hand. And you didn't tell me that detail, because? Wasn't sure if it was important. He moved around me, heading to the infirmary, but I blocked his way. Now what? What game are you playing? No idea what you're talking about. I walked with him, not letting him get around me. Bullshit. Do yourself a favor. Stay away from Emery. Gentry crossed his arms. You've been spying on me, is that it? Keeping an eye on you because I knew you'd take this too far. I haven't done anything except talk to her. Try to be her friend, which is more than you've done. You can ignore her all you want, but until I'm sure she's not hiding anything about who she is, I'm going to keep learning as much as I can about her. And what happens if you do find out she's hiding something? I asked sharply when he stepped around me. Depends on what it is. It's wrong, getting someone to trust you like that, and you know it. He stopped walking but said nothing. He didn't even look at me. If Gentry did believe Emery somehow was not who she said she was, he wouldn't simply be talking to her and acting like her friend. He wouldn't spend every day with her. I knew him too well for that. He had plenty of connections in Burning Glade, and any one of them could do a check on Emery Dupree. Why don't you simply admit the truth? And what is the truth? 
You are wrong to be suspicious of her. And you like her. You're wrong. Am I? Then why did you ask her to the Halloween party? Taking her on a date to get closer to her. Is that your plan? He whirled around, jaw clenched, eyes glowing red. Back off. I'm your friend, remember? I'm trying to be here for you, but you're making it damn hard when you're pulling stunts like this. She's happy right now. If she finds out what you're doing, it'll crush her. His eyes glowed brighter. He stalked closer. How would you know if she's happy? I have eyes. I notice things. And I spoke with her tonight. Told her to stay away from you. You really think she'll listen to the guy who's been ignoring her? He smirked when I hissed softly. She mentioned you briefly. Not a fan of yours lately. I don't care if she is or isn't. I'm doing this for both your sakes. I thought of Emery's pale face and how she hadn't been staring at the dead body. Or how quickly she'd taken off after Jana started yelling about death magic. You saw something, Gentry whispered. I did my best not to react. Yeah, the murdered body of a dead student. No, it has to do with Emery. Was she with you when you found the body? Not sure what that has to do with anything. He rolled his eyes. Of course you wouldn't. Anything else happen? Did she say something? Do something. You're grasping at straws. And you're avoiding the question, he yelled, his voice echoing off the stones. Am I interrupting? Julian asked. I hadn't seen him exit the infirmary, let alone appear behind us. Alistair? No, Gentry muttered, glaring. We're finished. Sure you are, Julian murmured. Fairmain called a meeting. All staff is required to meet in the dining hall to discuss the current situation. Gentry hissed at me in passing, but dropped the argument and headed toward the dining hall. That sounded pleasant, Julian commented as he and I eventually followed. Trouble in paradise? I shot him a look and he smirked. Oh come on. You two have been friends since you were turned. What's gotten into you guys? He's being difficult. Have anything to do with the death magic legislation they're trying to pass? Something like that. Has him on edge seeing enemies everywhere. And I bet these murders don't help. Julian grunted in understanding. Or having a witch yelling about it being caused by a necromancer. That was probably the worst bit. Someone needed to talk with Janna to shut her up. Then there was Gentry. He wasn't going to be convinced by anything I said or did. He was a vampire who made decisions based on what he saw for himself. We reached the hall and found a place to stand near the sidelines. Gentry sat at one of the tables. When he saw me, his nostrils flared and he scowled. I shifted from one foot to the other, willing him to get control of his anger. He turned around to face the front of the room. His expression grew frigid and his shoulders stiffened. Headmistress Julia Fairmain entered and stepped onto the raised platform. She moved behind the black iron podium and raised her hands, calling for quiet. Unlike many of the headmistresses before her, Fairmain had her own unique style. She wore black leather pants and a blood-red shirt beneath a black and silver leather corset. Long tendrils of red and black hair hung well below her waist and were braided and entwined with charms of the stars and the moon. Her usually light green eyes were more yellow tonight, giving away how much these murders upset her. Strong hands closed around the top of the podium, while those glimmering eyes looked at the assembled staff. She was tall, even without the boots she wore, and it wasn't hard to understand why she was the beta of the Crimson Paw Pack, the strongest one amongst the shifters. Several pale scars marred her jaw and wrapped around her neck. She was not a wolf to mess with. Whoever was causing these murders would have hell to pay if she caught them. I wish I could stand up here with news that didn't involve the gruesome murder of a professor and a student, yet here I am, she said, her voice coming out in a growl. I must ask every one of you now to be more vigilant than you've ever been. We are upping our security measures. While the guard investigates these murders, they will also be lending us a number of their own to assist us in keeping our students and faculty safe. Do they know what did it yet, 
a witch, Professor Bailey, asked from the front of the room. We have no answers, Fairmain replied. But I trust we will soon. For now, our job is to enforce these new rules. No one is to leave the main building or inner gardens without an escort. That includes faculty. Obviously, we can't instill a curfew, but we will have a rotating watch schedule for all faculty members. You will be stationed in pairs. No one is to be anywhere alone, unless it's in your rooms or offices. And what of the rumors? Gentry snapped. I inwardly hissed at him to shut up, before he let everyone else see how paranoid he was becoming. Yet he continued, Jan is telling everyone death magic was involved. Fairmain sighed heavily, gripping the podium hard enough to bend the iron. She relaxed her grasp and folded her hands on top of it instead. I want to make this very clear, she said, her words measured. Until we have proof of who or what killed these two vampires, we are not to speculate. I do not want to hear anything more about death magic being involved, or that we have a necromancer on the loose. All that will do is cause fear and panic. Our students need to feel they are still safe, so that they may continue their studies. This is our goal. Remind them that they are safe within these walls. But they're not, Gentry argued. Fairmain's lip twitched, her yellow eyes narrowing. There is no necromancer at my academy. Do I make myself clear? Gentry pushed up from the table and stormed out, hissing viciously. The door slammed behind him, the resounding boom echoing around the hall. Fairmain's eyes flicked to me, a tick starting on her jaw. I moved for the door without question, and went after Gentry to calm him down. Fairmain continued speaking as I left, but I turned my attention to the furious vampire pacing the corridor, his fists quivering at his sides. She's putting everyone at risk, he said, voice clipped. Everyone. She's doing everything she can to keep us safe, aside from closing down the academy. And if there is a necromancer here, we'll find him. Or her. I blurred into his path. He jerked back. I would not be deterred. He had to hear this. You should get a hold of yourself. Do I need to alert Brolin that you're falling apart? You know as well as I do, he'll yank your ass home if he feels you're losing control. Is that what you want? To show him how unstable you actually are. I waited to be punched in the face. Instead, Gentry's shoulders sagged with deflated anger, and he took a step back. You're right. What was that? About my being unstable. You're right. He held up his hand, adding, but not about Emery. Liking someone again isn't a bad thing. Kylie would want you to move on. Don't talk about her, he whispered harshly. Just don't. His gaze turned wild. He stumbled over his feet, turned, and blurred away. Chapter 7 Gentry Days had passed since the second murder victim was discovered, and the academy had undoubtedly changed. Students no longer chatted excitedly in the halls. They kept their heads down, whispering to each other about who might have been the killer. No matter how many times Fairmain said there was no death magic involved, officially, the rumors continued. I blamed Jana and her group of friends. She told anyone who'd give her the time of day that she sensed a necromancer was here, and had been since the first day of classes. Those rumors were the reason a tremendous sense of fear filled the air now. Jana and her big mouth were really starting to piss me off. Whenever we crossed paths, I'd glower at her until she'd scurry away, shooting me furious looks over her shoulder, exactly like she did about five minutes ago. You know, you keep looking at a witch like that, she's likely to hex you. I raised a brow. Speaking from experience. Emery fiddled with her necklace while watching Jana and her gaggle of friends disappear around a turn in the corridor. Me. I'm a nice witch. She winked and nudged my arm. You really don't like Jana. I have my reasons. Oh yeah. And what are those? She asked, moving with me when I walked toward the courtyard. Gentry. Her big mouth for one. You mean her blabbering that she sensed death magic, and that some crazy necromancer is on campus picking vampires off one by one? I shot her a sideways glance. She shrugged. 
You're not the only one she's pissing off. It's all she talks about now. She's in a few of my classes. Brings it up every day. You don't sound worried. About a necromancer. No reason to be worried. That. Plus, why would they murder Professor Dolan and a random student? She shook her head, but tugged even harder on her necklace. Whoever killed them is probably some crazy psychopath. Which, in hindsight, I'm not sure if that's better or worse. Depends on the psychopath. Yeah. Guess that's a good point. Maybe it's one who has a fetish with feet. I laughed. Feet. They both had their feet perfectly intact, as far as I know. Exactly. Could be this psychopath really likes their feet. That's why he or she removes their heads and does whatever to the rest of them. She gulped and shuddered. Hey, you okay? I asked, bringing her to a stop with a touch on her arm. Yeah, I'm great. I keep seeing the body of that dead girl, but yep, I'm awesome. She sounded far from awesome. Without thinking about what I was doing, I pulled her into a tight hug. She tensed for a second but relaxed and wrapped her arms around me. We stood in the gardens while students passed on their way to classes or their dorms. A voice somewhere in the back of my mind yelled at me to get my shit together, but my arms remained firm her emery. She trembled and I held her closer. Sorry, no I'm probably a bit cold, I murmured. She laughed. Doesn't really bother me. Grew up in the mountains. Used to the cold. She leaned back, chewing on her cheek while a shadow of fear passed through her eyes. I, uh, I didn't think it would get to me that badly, you know. I didn't know her or anything, but seeing her body like that hit me worse than I thought. I kept my gaze locked on her face, searching for any sign she was lying. Her breathing quickened, matching her racing pulse. When her hands fisted in the back of my fleece jacket with a fierce grip, I motioned my head to the right. Why don't we go to our place? We can talk there. If you have time. She checked her watch. Have an hour till my next class. Taking hold of her hand, I guided her through the gardens, inside the breezeway and to the library. Neither of us said a word until we reached the small study room on the fourth floor. Once we were alone, she tugged her hand from mine and dumped her bag on the couch. Absently, my hand closed, wanting the warmth of hers back. I gave my head a hard shake and shoved my hands in my jacket pockets. I waited for Emery to say something, but she remained by the couch, a confused look in her eyes, like she wasn't sure why she was there. You can talk to me, I assured her, willing Alistair's warning to stop lying to Emery to go away. About anything, I added. I'm here for you. She gave me a curious glance and walked around the couch. She sat, but only for a second. Back on her feet, she crossed one arm across her body while she fidgeted with her necklace. You say that now, but there's a reason I don't have a lot of friends. Her words drew me a few steps closer. I'm not going to run out that door no matter what you tell me, if that's what you're worried about. Her teasing about the necromancer on campus could have been to cover up the truth. Shit. Was she going to confess to being one? What if she was the one doing the killings? Hell, what if she tried to kill me right then and there? I slid my hands from my pockets and moved my right foot back, making ready for an attack. Emery turned her back on me and moved to the other side of the room. Was she preparing for an attack? My lip twitched. A snarl of anger at what was about to happen nearly fell from my mouth. The second she spoke, I swallowed it down, my brow crinkling in confusion. I'm having nightmares, Emery whispered, staring out the windows. She rubbed her hands up and down her arms like she couldn't get warm, though the fire burned brightly beside her. I'm in the gardens and she's there but she doesn't have eyes. She's talking, but the words are garbled. Then suddenly, it's not her anymore. It's me. I'm staring at a dead version of myself. She sucked in a sharp breath, her shoulders shaking. There are all these hands and they pull at me. I can't see who's doing it, and I can't help the vampire or myself. I'm useless. There's a scream, and it wakes me up every time. This was not a vicious, heartless killer. She couldn't be. I'd seen plenty of those throughout my long life so far, and Emery wasn't one. 
there wasn't a hint of deceit in those words. Every single one was true. Her pounding heart and irregular breathing were dead giveaways. She was terrified. Why didn't you tell me sooner? She shrugged, continuing to face the window. You've got a lot to deal with right now. They're only nightmares. They'll go away, eventually. They always do. What was that supposed to mean? I'm your friend, I reminded her and closed the distance between us, pondering her words. You can dump your worries and your fears on me anytime. That's what I'm here for. Slowly, she spun around. The loneliness in those green eyes slammed into me like a punch to the gut. For now, she murmured. You're here for now. Everyone leaves eventually. Things happen and they go away. It's just how life is. You still have your cousin, right? Rose. I reminded her, struggling to deal with the weight of loss and pain staring back at me. And I'm still here. Rose can't always be my shoulder to cry on. She has her own life to live. And you. We've only known each other for a few weeks. Who says this is anything more than passing the time for us both? She swiped at her eyes and squared her shoulders. Maybe we shouldn't keep hanging out. An uncomfortable grimace crossed her face while she rolled her right shoulder. I don't think I can do this, I'm sorry. I should go. No. You can't simply tell me no when I'm trying to leave. I just did. She stepped to the right and I moved with her, blocking her way. She stepped left and I did it again. Gentry, come on. I'm not letting you leave this room, thinking you can't trust me. I wanted her to talk to me, but now I couldn't decide if it was because I was merely striving to find answers to who she was, or if Alistair was right. Did I like Emery? Did I want her to be more than a friend? I hissed softly. Why do you want to be alone? She tilted her head. I don't want to be. That's simply how it works out. It always will be if you're the one walking away, which is what you're doing right now. You don't get it, all right? She raised her voice, but there was no anger in her words. No one ever does. Tears shimmered in her eyes. She pressed the heels of her palms to them so hard it had to hurt. Gently, I moved her hands and held them. A few tears slipped down her cheeks to her jawline. You lost someone, didn't you? She attempted to free herself, but I held onto her hands, not letting her run away, not yet. In that small room with only the two of us, the realization that Emery and I were more alike than I first assumed left me wondering what else I was wrong about. One possible glimpse of a mark that wasn't even on her neck, and I'd been ready to interrogate her, like she was the enemy that had destroyed my life. I'd been prepared to kill her if need be. In all the time I spent with Emery, not once did she give off any vibes of being a killer. Instead, somehow, we really had become friends. Leave it to me, to make my only other friend, aside from Alistair, by being a manipulative bastard. If she ever found out the truth, gods, I didn't think I'd be able to deal with that look of disappointment. When Emery made to leave again, I let go of her hands. Then I surprised myself by making a confession. I lost my family long time ago. I know that feeling of thinking you're alone. She stopped at the couch, her hand outstretched for her bag. I continued, you never mention your family aside from Rose. Did something happen to them? I waited for this to be like all the other times I'd tried to dig into her past, and she'd shut me down. She shoved her hands in the back pockets of her jeans and pointedly stared at the floor. After gulping a few times, her head fell forward on a sigh weighed down by grief. When I was little, my parents were, uh, they were involved in an incident. Some vampire and his buddies got blood drunk and wandered into our small community. They started attacking people on the streets, killed quite a few. Her face paled. I wasn't sure I wanted to hear the rest. The pain in her voice was too familiar. She continued, my parents were good people, healers and magical teachers. They tried to stop them, but the vampires were too far gone to be reasoned with. Too far gone to see that they were murdering innocents. Were they killed? Your parents. What she'd told me rang a bell. Vaguely, I recalled hearing about a group of vampires who went on a killing spree. 
I'd had no idea it was this bad. Worse. She choked over the word, and swallowed a few times like she fought the urge to be sick. The vampires barricaded themselves and their hostages in a house for three days. Including my parents. And me. I growled, picturing little Emery trapped with those bastards. It was our house. Her eyes scrunched shut and the silence stretched on. When she spoke again, her voice was barely a whisper. When we were finally rescued, Dad had been nearly bled out and they'd tortured Mom. I saw it all, but Dad was able to keep me safe for the most part. Mom wasn't ever right in the head again. A bitter laugh filled the room when she added, she tried to kill me a few months after the incident. What? Emery traced a thin scar at her neck, her expression taking on a faraway look. She thought was seeing those vampires, though I was the only one home. Dad got there in time, but it scared her. So they dumped me with my cousin and took off to keep me safe. I get letters, but mom won't allow me to visit, and dad can't leave her side. I clenched my hands, confused by the sympathy overriding my last clinging suspicions about Emery. You got to stay with family, though. That's good. Have you met my cousin? She tried to be there for me but she was constantly telling me to get over it and move on with my life. I love her to death, but she never understood. No one did. I was simply the lost little girl with a crazy mom. So I put on a smile, and as far as anyone knows, I got on with my life. My plans for manipulating her disappeared, leaving me feeling like an utter asshole. I sensed she wasn't telling me everything, but this was a start. Her pain, her fear of being haunted by those memories, that was real. Her face mirrored my own when I was forced to recall the worst night of my life. Why don't you talk to anyone here? No one knows you. You'd never even have to tell them about your parents. I didn't have to tell you, but here I am doing just that. One way or another, if you get close to someone, your secrets come out. She crossed her arms abruptly like she got a chill. I know what comes next, and it's always the same. The pitying glances, the light bulb going off in your head saying my past explains everything about me. You'll think you know me now because of my messed up past. You'll tell me I should look to the future and embrace life, live it to the fullest, and all that other throw pillow bullshit the humans buy. Anytime I'm upset, you'll think it's because I'm wallowing in the past, or you'll wonder if I'm becoming depressed again, or hell. I could even be going crazy like my mother did. Maybe it wasn't from the attack after all. Her rant ended and she scoffed, her eyes narrowing. I didn't mean to, but I laughed. She glared and my brow arched. Throw pillow bullshit, huh? You heard me, she replied, laughing now too. It's true though, she murmured a few seconds later, her smile falling. Every time. So that means you what, give up on finding friends? On something more? I've made it this far without anyone, haven't I? She strode across the room and rested her hands against the mantel, scowling into the fire. Maybe this wasn't a good idea, after all. I'm sorry if I made you think it was, but I don't think I can do this. There's too much that I, she cut herself off and hunched her shoulders. The sympathy I'd been feeling flowed right back into suspicion. Emery. I should go. I blurred to her when she turned, stopping her from leaving. Wait please. You don't get it but that's my fault and it's okay. It has to be okay because I don't have any other choice and you're making this a lot harder than I thought it would be, she mumbled, her eyes pleading with me to move. She might have told me the truth about her parents but whatever she left out was worse, much worse. I shouldn't be talking to you, not like this. Shit. I knew I'd mess up coming here. I knew it. Emery slowed down. Look at me, I urged, catching her arm. She tensed but didn't pull away. I'm not going to tell you to get over your past. I've seen things that I'll never forget. Words were coming out of my mouth now, and I had no idea what I was even saying or why. I'm happy you shared your past with me. It means you trust me and the last thing I'm going to do is get annoyed at you for having bad days or weeks or months. The lie sat heavy in my gut, but I had to figure out what she was hiding. She nibbled her bottom lip, her gaze darting wildly around the room. 
Her pulse sped up. I sensed her body tensing, ready to make a break for it. I can't tell you everything, not yet. Damn. The tiny sliver of hope that I'd overreacted disappeared with those simple words. That's okay as long as you know, I'm here for you, no matter what. I was laying on the lies now, without even thinking. A voice in the back of my mind that sounded an awful lot like Alistair said to back off, and tell her the truth, or stop talking to her altogether. A louder voice shouted we needed the truth, no matter what it took. Emery hung her head, looking torn between believing me and running for the door. Gently, I cupped her cheek and ran my fingers through her hair. Her grief-filled gaze turned confused, and a glint of attraction I'd seen a few times before now sparked to life strong and alive. I failed to remember the last time I held someone like this. If I had a pulse, it would have been as fast as hers was right then. Her fingers trailed lightly down my cheeks while the firelight danced in her eyes. I stepped closer, unsure what was happening between us. Too many years of being alone and pissed off caught up with me, and all I wanted was to hold someone and have someone hold me back. I wanted to feel something other than burning hatred. Somehow, Emery eased that raging storm, though I hated to admit it. Talking to her these last few weeks hadn't merely been about getting answers. That part was easy. I'd only been able to speak to one other being like this. I'd given her my heart and believed I'd lost it when she died. Our lips were so close all I had to do was move an inch further and I'd kiss her. Was that what I wanted? Gentry, Emery whispered, shattering the moment. Reluctantly, I let her go and backed away, bewildered at the disappointment churning in my gut. I'm sorry that, I cleared my throat. Ah, uh, that was too soon. Or something, I rambled like an idiot. She blinked, but a curious smile spread across her face. Or something. She checked the clock on the wall, sighing. I need to get to class anyway. Thanks for listening. Means more than you know. Any time. She rested her hand on my arm, but it wasn't nearly enough. Guess I'll get going. Yeah. Later, M. She tugged her tote onto her shoulder. Later, General. Rubbing the back of my neck, I paced to the windows, glowering. You almost kissed her, I whispered. What are you thinking? I should have done it too. Why had I pulled back? Because you're lying to her. Grunting, I let my head fall to the window, forehead resting on the glass. Rain pattered against it. Lightning lit up the night sky. While thunder rumbled, I sank onto the couch, threw my feet up onto the opposite arm and laid down. Between the occasional deep growl of thunder and the crackling fire, I drifted into a strange doze, caught between wakefulness and sleep. Echoes of shrieks grew louder and louder. I scrunched my face, telling myself to wake up, but I was helpless to fight back against the pull of the nightmare. The shrieks turned to screams. The stench of rotting flesh assaulted my nose while coldness surrounded me. Not my usual vampiric cold, but an icy touch that pierced my skin. Figures and twisted faces raced past me. All I could do was watch. Gentry. I spun around at the sound of that voice. Kylie. The chaos of that horrid night seemed to speed up around us, until everything blurred, and only Kylie remained. She held out her hand toward me, blood dripping from slashes across her face. More covered her body, and a gaping hole resided where her heart should have been. Every detail of this night was etched into my mind. The nightmares always replayed them for me, but this time was different. Kylie lunged forward and grabbed hold of my arm, digging her nails deep enough to draw blood. Emery, she rasped and froze. What did you say? Emery, she repeated. I gasped at the sharp pain from her nails, tearing my arm apart. She's the key, protect her. The rest of the words died, and she aimed her fangs for my throat. Snarling, I bolted upright. Kylie wasn't there. She wasn't trying to kill me. Hissing, I threw my legs over the couch and rubbed my face hard enough to hurt. Dawn had broken over the mountains, but the storm clouds lingered. Didn't stop my senses from warning me the sun was up. On wobbly legs, I walked to the door, resting against the frame at the threshold. It had been years since I had a nightmare of the attack. They were always the same. 
always. Except it wasn't, I murmured, frowning. Kylie had said Emery's name. She said her name and protect her. What the hell was that supposed to even mean? And she was the key. Key to what? It was only a nightmare. None of it was real. Grumbling about unhelpful messages, I was halfway down the hall when a feather light touch brushed against my cheek. Gentry, protect her. Kylie. I whirled around, but I was alone. Gritting my teeth, I forced myself to keep walking. A second touch on the back of my neck, and I sprinted to my apartment, slamming and locking the door behind me. She wasn't here. She couldn't be here, and I wasn't about to start listening to cryptic messages from the dead. Chapter 8 Gentry The campus was decorated from top to bottom for the week of Halloween. We didn't celebrate it like the humans did, but it was used as an excuse to party anyway. Any other year, and the festivities would have taken place on the grounds extending beyond the walls, into the orchard, cemetery and the more extensive gardens. The guard and staff strictly forbid it, and for once let the students host their night of games and drinking in the courtyard gardens and the dining hall. The night of the party came, and I debated hiding in my apartment. I'd only spoken to Emery a couple of times, keeping each conversation short. Hearing her name in my nightmare had made me suddenly regret lying to her as I had. If she were a necromancer, the last person on this earth to tell me to protect her would be Kylie. Not that I believed it was really her spirit talking to me. My instincts said it was time to come clean and tell Emery the truth. Every time I saw her though, the words became lodged in my throat. Tonight was going to be a disaster if I left my room. Emery would get the hint when I didn't show up. I was pouring myself a small goblet of blood when a knock came at my door. Sniffing the air, I sighed at the strong smell of cinnamon and the hint of sweetness that accompanied it. Emery. I was at the door and pulling it open without realizing what I was doing. Too late now. Emery stood in the hall, holding a black rose. Hey, she said and held it out to me. What's this for? What? Can't a girl bring a guy a flower on their first date? She teased with a wink. I stared at it, torn between blurting out the truth and taking the rose. She shuffled her feet and fiddled with her charm necklace. Her cheeks reddened and she lowered her head. Yeah, stupid idea. Ah, uh, I wasn't sure if you were coming down to the party, but you don't have to if you don't want. Maybe a date was too soon for us both. She turned to go when I laid my hand on her shoulder and spun her back around. Gentry. We really don't have to go together. You've been kind of broody lately and way more quiet than normal. I get it. I mean, I'm not entirely sure how to navigate this either. We can pretend none of this happened. I stiffened at the thought of Kylie's words whispering through my mind. Emery drew back again. I shook my head and took the rose. Thanks for this. Did you want to come in for a minute? Have to grab my boots. I stepped back and Emery entered my apartment. This is pretty nice, she commented shoving her hand in her back pocket while the other remained attached to her necklace. Not too bad. Let's me hide up here indefinitely if I want to. I set the rose in an empty whiskey bottle and filled it with water from the sink. And I'm sorry for being broody. Is that what you called it? She smirked. Yeah, broody. She followed me to the living room, keeping her distance. You can talk to me too, you know. About anything. I'm a good listener. Thanks. I appreciate that. Is it me? Is what you? I asked, tugging on my boots and rising off the couch. Why you're being kind of weird? No, I lied and attempted a smile. Her eyebrow twitched and I knew she didn't believe me. How about we go enjoy this party? I offered her my arm and she wrapped her hand around my elbow. The walk downstairs was uneventful and quiet. I opened my mouth several times to confess to my motives for befriending her. Each time, an uncomfortable unease in my stomach made me stop. Telling Emery the truth meant I might lose her. She'd be pissed, and she had every right to be. 
If I'd listened to Alistair, I never would have met her, gotten to know her. I still might have bumped into her another way, and not be worried she was going to turn around and hex me for being an asshole. Loud music blared out the dining hall doors. Others danced and laughed. I waited for Emery to tug us inside, but she shook her head. You don't want to join them? I asked, leaning in close so she could hear me over the noise. Do you? Besides, my cousin's in there. If she sees us together, I'll never shake her. Really? Oh yeah. How about a walk instead? The moon was full, its glow lighting the gardens. Emery nodded eagerly, and we turned away from the heart of the party to wander the courtyard gardens. A few groups moved to the stone paths and the breezeway, but it was far quieter out here. Emery's hand remained tucked in my elbow while she talked about the last week of classes. I nodded here and there, simply enjoying the sound of her voice. Back when we first met, I was lucky to hear a few sentences now and then. Now she was relaxed and talked to me as she would a friend. Another pang of guilt stabbed me. I winced. You sure you're okay? She asked, her eyes filling with worry. I am. Liar. I shrugged. Fine, I'm not, but it doesn't have to do with us. Promise. If you say so. Emery slipped away once we were behind several tall trellises, covered in white, violet, and blue moon blossoms. They'd open tonight, to soak in the light of the full moon. She shut her eyes, smelling them, and carefully tucked a few errant vines back in place. I always loved these flowers, she murmured. You spend all month tending to them, only to see them open for three nights. Then they close again, wither and die until the next full moon when more blooms appear. Why do you sound so sad about a flower? She shrugged, picking up a fallen blue blossom and twirling it slowly between her fingers. I don't know. Maybe it's because very few see their beauty before they grind them up for the magic in their petals. A lot of people don't always see what's right in front of them. What's beneath the surface? They only see what they want to see. She let out a nervous laugh, her gaze flicking to mine. Sorry, I'm not making much sense tonight. I joined her by the vining flowers, brushing my fingers over the soft petals of a violet blossom. Maybe not, but some of us do. Yeah. And what do you see? I see eyes that shimmer in the moonlight, and when you smile, when you truly smile, I mused quietly. Eyes that shine with so much emotion, sometimes it makes me wonder how you keep it together. I see someone who carries pain she hasn't been able to let go of yet. She licked her lips and turned her head. I turned her back so I could keep gazing into those green eyes that left me feeling calmer than I had in decades. I see a determination to prove you're more than your past and a beauty that has quite a few jealous. Her ebony hair hung loose around her shoulders tonight. I ran my fingers through those long locks, admiring the blue highlights that appeared in the glow of the moon. She swallowed hard, her lips parting. There's something I want to tell you. There's something I need to tell you too, I replied, noticing how little space remained between us. The words were right there on the tip of my tongue, but the sound of her racing heart echoed in my ears. Nothing else mattered at that moment except doing what I should have done before. Gentry. I shook my head. It can wait. I cupped her cheeks in my palms and slanted my lips across hers. It started simple, my lips brushing across her warm ones, but she wrapped her arms around my neck and kissed me back. I let her soothing presence surround me while our lips moved together in a fiery dance I never expected to experience again. I remembered all too clearly what being with Kylie had done to me. But with Emery it was stronger, fiercer, and for some strange reason my mind failed to comprehend it was more right. Every bit of this moment was natural, like we'd been together for years. The scent of cinnamon permeated the air. Her hands warm against my back, her magic pushing to the surface. When I opened my eyes, hers glowed with a soft green hue. I saw my red ones reflected in hers. She smiled and kissed me again while my hands wandered down her back, crushing her to my chest. I would have been content to stay there a while longer when a harsh smell cut through the apples. I drew back with a hiss, glaring in the direction the scent wafted from. Gentry. 
Blood! I whispered, taking her hand and pulling her along with me. We hurried through the gardens to the breezeway, then inside. I sniffed the air, following the pungent stench of death and blood to the main foyer. The second we turned the corner, I stopped and attempted to block Emery from seeing. She peered past me and clapped a hand to her mouth, her eyes wide in horror. Oh goddess, she whispered, turned to the side and vomited. I held back her hair until she waved me away, muttering I needed to get help. Too late for that, I muttered, holding her upright until she was finished being sick. She's dead. Where the hell are the guard? she asked, shaking. I had no idea. They should have been here. I yelled down the corridor, waiting for someone to respond. Emery cast a spell that would send a flare into the halls to alert whatever staff was around. I told her after she should get back to her dorm, but she held fast to my hand. Not about to leave you alone when there's a damn psychopath on the loose. I drew her into my side and kissed the top of her head, turning us around so we could no longer see the body. Little help that did. Whoever killed the vampire had hung her from the wall, upside down. The corpse was headless like all the others, and the body was slashed right down the middle. Blood pooled beneath it and set perfectly in the center, planted there most likely by the killer, was the vampire's head. She'd been a professor of magical theory, and I believed her husband worked within the guard. I hoped he wasn't stationed here. Five long minutes passed until help finally arrived. The moment one of the vampires saw the body, he let out a bellow of pure agony and fell to his knees in the gore. Evidently her husband worked right here, and that was him. Emery buried her face in my chest, fisting her hands in my shirt. I held her while we answered questions, all the while listening to the vampire mourn his love. I knew those sounds all too well. I'd made them myself a long time ago. When Emery and I were released from the scene, I escorted her to her dorm. The whole way there, Kylie's words replayed in my mind, and I flinched each time I sensed a touch on my cheek. Ignoring it the best I could, I hugged Emery one more time and left after she assured me she'd be all right. I bolted for my room and spent the remainder of the night and well into the next day, trying to understand what any of this had to do with Emery. And why whoever this killer was had targeted vampires. Chapter 9 Emery A sharp knock at my door made me jump, cursing. Hey you in there? Rose called. With a shaky hand I snapped my fingers, and the door opened for her to enter. What's up? She crossed her arms and stared at me. What's up? Are you serious? Yes, I said slowly, shutting the book on the origins of death magic I'd finally been able to find in the library, thanks to Henry's help. It hadn't told me anything I didn't know already, but there was a chance I'd get something out of it. Did I do something? You have that pinched look on your face that says I'm about to get a lecture. Oh you are, she declared. Why am I only now hearing from random witches that you're hanging out with Gentry Wilson? I blanched, avoiding her gaze. And who's saying that? A lot of people. Why am I the last to hear about this, she demanded. How long have you been hanging out with him? Does it matter? Yeah it does. She dragged over my desk chair and sat down. Why wouldn't you tell me? Are you dating him or something? Gentry Wilson is a big name, you know. I do, don't you worry about that. I shoved my hands through my hair. I've been talking to him since the beginning of the semester, give or take a few days. What? Are you serious? I shrugged, fiddling with my necklace. We bumped into each other at the library, and then he started showing up at the room I used to study, and well, we kind of hit it off, I guess. Just friends. Talking, hanging out, studying together. And? And what? And are you two still just friends? Someone said they saw you making out at the Halloween party. You don't make out with me, she said with a wink and I chucked my pillow at her. Oh come on, that was funny. You're ridiculous. What? Emery, I'm happy for you, she said in a rush when I climbed off the bed and marched to the bathroom. I am really. This is great. You made a friend and not only a friend. 
you're dating someone who's not from our hometown. You have any idea how amazing this is? She rushed over and hugged me. Mom will be thrilled. Don't go telling her about this. Not sure how long it's going to last. Why not? You like him, I can tell you do. That's the problem. I wrung my hands bouncing on the balls of my feet. I told you getting close to someone was a bad idea. It's always going to be a bad idea. The raven on my shoulder shifted beneath the skin, sensing my agitation. I almost told him. Told him what? She asked, confused. Two seconds later, her jaw dropped. Emery. I said almost and don't give me that look. You're the one that's always telling me to open up and make friends and find a guy. Well, I found a guy and I nearly blurted that I'm a damn. She slapped her hand over my mouth. Are you insane? Don't say that so loud. Not with the murders and Jana spouting that there's death magic involved. I glared until she lowered her hand. Sorry? Yeah? About which part? I snapped. What am I supposed to do here, Rosé? What? I like him, okay? Like really like him but when I'm with him I'm lying. I'm lying right to his face and it's not fair to him or me. It's not freaking fair and I'm sick of it. I never should have talked to him to begin with. I stormed around my room, shaking out my hands while my magic pulsed beneath the surface wanting an outlet. I hadn't felt this unsteady in a long time. Between Gentry and these murders, I was quickly losing focus and forgetting why I'd come here in the first place. Maybe he'll be someone you can trust with the truth. I froze. He's a vampire. And? Not all of them are against your kind, she whispered, shooting a worried glance at the door though it was shut tight. You won't know until you tell him. And the second I do, he'll hate me and I'll be thrown on out on my ass or arrested. I'm not supposed to be here, remember? What if he goes crazy like the other ones did? What if? I was not willing to go down memory lane right then. I rubbed at my side absently, at a familiar tingling I hadn't felt in a long time. Rose snagged my hands and gripped them hard. Don't go back to that moment. We talked about this. And do you really think Gentry's that kind of vamp? No, I replied but didn't sound very convincing. He's in line for the throne of his house. It's too risky. So you tell him and if he reacts badly, we leave. Just like that? Why not? We'll go home and find another way to get the answers you need. I'll go home, I corrected. We're in this together, she argued, but I backed away, shaking my head. Emery. No. You can't always be there for me, not now. You have a life to figure out, and I'm not going to keep holding you back to deal with my shit. I took a deep breath and let it out. You're right though. I can't keep the truth from him, not when I like him this much. If I don't decide to do it, the words will slip out one day. There's no rush, she said, and I hated how sad she sounded. I don't want you to have to run off so soon. There might be answers here. Haven't found anything yet. And telling him while murders are happening on campus might not be the best idea. I shuddered when an image of the latest victim appeared in my mind. Rose hugged me, cursing about being an idiot to bring them up. It's fine. I'm doing okay for the most part. There was so much blood. It was worse than the last one and hearing that vampire's yells. I scrunched my eyes shut, but I'd never forget those shouts of pure agony. Or the look that crossed Gentry's face. Sympathy mixed with regret and his own pain, like this wasn't the first time he'd heard someone being emotionally ripped apart. I need to do something. Rose frowned when I opened the wardrobe and removed the raven statue from its hiding place. Like what? Figure out if there is death magic involved. Are you crazy? It's bad enough Jana's talking about it, but if anyone catches you doing it, the guard won't hesitate to take you away. Are you listening to me? Nodding, I set the statue on my small altar, and with a snap of my fingers, lit the black and white candles in their little black metal holders. I need to know. What if there's someone else like me who's a student? Then you should stay very far away from them, 
while they continue their murdering rampage. I can't do that. Why do you have to be like your parents? Saving people you don't even know. It's in my blood. I settled into a cross-legged position on the floor and shut my eyes. Each breath was measured while I relaxed, resting my hands palms up on my knees. Once my body was calm, I opened my eyes and focused on the raven statue. It blinked and twisted its head to return my gaze. What killed the vampires? I thought the question over and over, waiting for an answer. The raven tattoo on my arm fluttered, spreading its wings and coming to life beneath my shirt. No clear answer came back to me, but a tugging started in my gut, telling me I wouldn't receive what I sought in this room. Damn. I pushed off the floor, blew out the candles and opened the wardrobe a second time. Well? Rose asked behind me. I'll be back in a bit, I said over my shoulder. Don't wait up. I pulled on a black shirt that I had made myself, so my shoulder and arm were bare. I pulled on my heavy black and white plaid flannel over top of it, and strode for the door. Wait, Rose said when I reached it, I'm coming with you. Why? So we both can get caught. So I can watch your back so you don't get caught. I'm going. Not wanting to waste any more time, we left my room and exited the dorms a short walk later. We had about an hour until sunup, which meant most students were in the dining hall or already back in their rooms. Avoiding the guard members and faculty keeping a watch on every inch of the grounds was going to make this tricky, but I had to know for sure how these vampires died. If death magic wasn't involved, I'd be able to relax slightly. If it was, well, I'd figure it out. The last murder had happened in the main foyer. Sitting down there in such an open space and reaching out to the spirit world was asking for trouble. There was a classroom at the end of the corridor that was unoccupied and unlocked. Checking to ensure no one saw us, we ducked into the room, kept the lights off, and locked the door. Rose took a spot to keep an eye out while I found a quiet corner and sat down. The tugging in my gut had grown with every step we took. Hoping this was close enough, I shrugged out of my flannel shirt and sat down. The raven spread his wings on my shoulder, itching to be let loose. I shook out my hands and rested them on my thighs. Shutting my eyes, I took a moment to center myself and ground my emotions. I was here to find the answer to a question, nothing more. With every breath in and out, the temperature dropped and I slipped into the spirit realm. When I opened my eyes, Rose was absent from the room and everything had a gray tinge to it, like I was looking at it through a veil. The raven fluttered free of my shoulder and flew around my head calling to me. Frost had formed on my physical body. I followed the raven out of the classroom, walking right through the door like it wasn't even there. The heaviness of recent death pressed into me. I struggled to maintain focus, sensing my body twitch, wanting to get away from it. I pushed onward while the raven flew overhead. He circled twice, and landed right where I'd seen the pool of blood from beneath the killer's latest victim. Humans believed the stories told about vampires, that they had no souls. That simply wasn't true. They had souls even after they were turned, and those souls came to this realm just like any other. I reached the raven, but there was no sign of the woman's spirit, not in the foyer. Well? I asked the raven, my word echoing down the corridor. The raven cawed and took off again, brushing his wing across my face. My teeth chattered at the icy touch, and I considered going back. I wasn't involved yet, but the moment I started poking around for answers, I would be. Grumbling to myself, I hurried after the large black bird soaring toward the gardens where the second victim had been found. I spotted several spirits roaming around, but most of them ignored me, content with their current situation. A few gave me annoyed looks for disrupting their peace and death. But there were three the raven fluttered over that drew my full attention. Three vampires holding their severed heads under their arms. There were no eyes, but when I stepped closer, the heaviness from those empty sockets struck me like a kick to the gut. At least here, there was no blood, but the extent of their wounds remained visible. Their bodies were cut open right down the middle. I didn't have to ask to know their hearts had been torn free. I'd overheard one of the guards say so when I'd been with Gentry. None of them spoke, 
and I took another moment to examine their spiritual states. Fine silver chains wrapped around their bodies, shimmering in the shifting light of this world. I've come to ask you how you died, I told them. Are you trapped here? Professor Dolan stepped forward, his brow furrowing. He held up his right arm, the one not holding his head. The silver chains wrapped around his body glowed with a sickly gray pallor when I stretched out a hand to them. The effect lessened when I moved back. You've been cursed to remain here but this magic it's strange. Who did this to you? All three victims shrugged, exchanging confused looks. You didn't see a face. Or hear their voice. Again they shrugged. I took in the extent of their wounds again, picturing all too clearly the gore left behind in their wake. I swallowed back bile, thankful I couldn't be sick in the spirit realm. The sorrow pouring off the student mixed with the anger of the two professors left me light-headed and struggling to remember why I was here. A strange voice whispered in my ear, but the words were so quiet I failed to understand them. The chains around the murdered vampires pulsed and I was transfixed. Staying here sounded like a good idea. It was safe here, after all. No one would ever find me again. I could simply drift away. The raven had kept circling overhead, now landed on my shoulder. He nipped at my ear and I gasped, jerking away from those cursed chains. I was here to get answers, but whoever enchanted these chains was powerful. Did they know I would come here? The notion that this was a trap fluttered through my mind, but I couldn't leave until I knew what we were dealing with. Already realizing the answer I was going to get, I asked, Did any of you sense death magic? They nodded and my shoulders slumped. Dolan pointed to me and smiled. Next, he pointed at his wounds and those of the others, a fearful frown forming on his face. You sensed it but it's not like mine? I guessed. Dolan nodded. You felt the cold? And what? Darkness? Dolan's lips moved, and I made out the word he was trying to relay. Evil. You felt evil in it. His head nodded a second time. Right, so there's an evil asshole on campus murdering vampires. That's great. The other professor, I couldn't recall her name, glided to me. I wasn't sure what her intentions were until it was too late to stop her. She pressed her free hand to my forehead. My mouth fell open in a soundless scream while I was sucked into the moment of her death. She'd been on watch with another professor, but was stopped by a student. She'd waved for the shifter to go on ahead since they were at the end of their rounds. The student was only with her for a few minutes until she hurried off too. The vampire had started to walk away when her body jerked to a stop, her arms twisting against her will. She wasn't in control of her body. In those horrible few minutes, I was overwhelmed by her fear, followed immediately by pain while her own nails tore into her body. I silently begged for her to let me go, but she pressed her hand harder to my forehead. I was forced to witness the horrifying moment she tore her own heart out and collapsed to the floor. Through her eyes I saw a pair of black-booted feet appear in her eyes, her body desperately attempting to heal itself. Her heart was wrenched from her hand. The vision ended when a blade was brought down on her neck, severing her head. Gagging, I fell to my knees, shaking uncontrollably. My chest and neck throbbed, feeling the ghost of her wounds. Through the pain and nausea, the reality of what I saw wasn't one I was ready to deal with, not that second. They were killed by death magic, that was damn obvious now, but it wasn't how I expected, not even close. Absently, I rubbed the back of my neck where my birthmark perched and cursed. This was bad, worse than bad. So much for my psychopath theory of it not involving a necromancer. There was nothing I could do with the information in the spirit realm, but I could free their spirits so they could move on. I glanced at the raven, and he flew to Dolan, circling him while I focused on the hope of being at peace. The hair sprouted from her place on my arm and joined the raven, working together to send the spirit on his way. The chains reacted instantly. When the raven and hair glowed brightly in the gray light, I waited for the links to snap and fall away. A high-pitched scream shot through me instead. I was thrown back. The raven cried out in pain and was slammed into the ground nearby, the hair not far behind. 
The chains around Dolan flared a deep red that shifted to black and constricted around his spirit. Whatever curse held them here was more powerful than I was. It would take time to break it, and time was something I didn't have. Emery, we need to go, Rose's voice reached me. Emery. Dolan urged me on, motioning for me to leave. I'm sorry, I whispered, picking up my wounded raven. I'm so sorry. I'll be back to free you. I promise. Rose called for me again, and with the raven and hair tucked in the crook of my arm, I sprinted to the classroom, through the door, to my body. Frost covered my hair and crept up my fingertips. The raven and hare, wounded but in one piece, both nudged my hand, a worried glint in their black eyes. The raven spread his wings and flattened himself back onto my shoulder. The hare shook out her tiny head and resumed her place on my forearm. I stepped into my physical body. The cold retreated and I shook my head, gasping and shivering. My teeth chattered so hard my face ached. A hand landed on my shoulder. I flinched, spinning around. Here get this on, Rose urged and helped me to my feet. What's wrong? I asked through gritted teeth. I shook out my hair to get rid of the frost, and rubbed my hands furiously up and down my arms. Faculty members. Guess they're doing their rounds. There are a few doors down. Hope you found out something good. Yeah, someone else here has death magic and is using it to make vamps kill themselves. She blinked at me, her jaw dropping. You're serious? Not something I'd make up. We can talk about it once we're back in the dorms. Right leaving. We're leaving. Slowly she pushed open the door and poked her head out. We're clear. She exited first, and I hurried to follow, quickly tugging on the sleeves of my shirt. There'd been no time to cast a new illusion spell on my right arm. We were a few yards from the door when someone called out. Stopping, we exchanged a glance and turned around to come face to face with Alistair. Emery, he asked, confused, looking from Rose to me. What are you doing down here? Chapter 10 Alistair I waited for Emery or her friend to answer me, but neither said a word. Well? Well what? Emery snapped. What are you doing down here? Where were you even coming from? She shoved her hair out of her face, trembling. Her gaze darted wildly around. She kept digging her nails into her arms and bouncing on the balls of her feet. Her eyes were wide with fear, and she clutched at her stomach like she was going to be sick. I was out for a walk, she mumbled and swallowed hard. At this hour of the morning. Her green eyes darted to the left when she shrugged. Couldn't sleep. Haven't really been able to since I saw that dead body in the foyer, she replied quietly, shifting her weight. I came with her, the other witch added. We're not supposed to be alone and all that. I crossed my arms, unsure if I should believe them or not. Both their hearts were racing, and Emery seemed extremely upset by something. I wondered if her agitation with me had to do with how I'd left our previous conversation. Can we talk for a minute? In private. I'll wait in the breezeway, the other witch said and strolled away. Julian had partnered with me for my rounds this morning, but I waved at him to stay back. He watched from a distance. What do you want to lecture me about today? Emery asked impatiently. And in case you're wondering, no, I didn't listen to you. I'm still hanging out with Gentry. I expected you would be. It's not as if we're friends. A flicker of hurt I didn't expect passed through her eyes. No, we're not. I'm sorry for being an ass, all right? I blurted quietly, hoping Julian wouldn't hear. I didn't handle this situation well. What situation? That was a damn good question. I wasn't sure why I was even having this conversation, instead of sending her on her way with a warning not to pointlessly wander around campus. My stomach clenched, and I was back to being a teenager talking to a beautiful girl. What the hell was wrong with me? Meeting you, I finally said. And yes, I wanted us to be friends, but then shit happened, and I know that's a terrible excuse, but I didn't handle any of this well. And it looks like I might have been wrong about Gentry. He's not acting like I thought he would. Emery said nothing, but her eyes gave it all away. 
confusion followed by annoyance. So you are jealous of him. I puffed out my cheeks and tucked my hands in my pockets, struggling to find the right words. If she only knew the truth of why Gentry was talking to her in the first place, she wouldn't be so keen on her friendship with him. He'd hate me if I did that, told her the truth. However, she had a right to know. And you're sure you're not doing this so she'll be alone again, and give you another chance? I hissed quietly at the nagging voice. Emery's brow furrowed. I shook my head, taking a step back. Doesn't matter if I am, I shouldn't have said what I did, I told her. Maybe one day, when this mess is over, we can try to be friends again. I like you, Emery, despite what you might believe. Her lips screwed to the side, her eyes narrowing. You two have been friends for a long time. That's what he told me. Yeah, we have. She tilted her head back and forth, a smile gracing her face. I get it. My cousin is my best friend. Anytime she's with a guy, I tend to get a bit annoyed. It happens. Guess it does. I was about to hold out my hand for hers when she raised her right hand to grasp her necklace. Her sleeve fell, and I spotted part of a tattoo on her wrist. She sucked in a sharp breath, and her pulse shot up. I sensed her making ready to take a step back, but caught her arm, preventing her from taking off. Something about that mark had my instincts screaming that something was wrong. Her sleeve fell down her forearm, and a tattooed hair appeared. It wasn't a lovely, fluffy white rabbit. The face was half skeletal, and I flinched when it twitched. Ready to shove her sleeve aside to discover what else she was hiding, I reached for her. Don't. That one word froze me in place. The strong scent of cinnamon and apples surrounded me. My hand moved on its own and released her arm. Emery gulped, stumbled over her feet, and ran off after the other witch. T. The moment she was out of sight, the weird sensation of not being in control of my body faded. I was left with a horrible twisting in my stomach, and a headache that stabbed at my brain. Alistair? Julian asked, rushing over to me. You all right? You look paler than normal. Fine, I grated. I'm fine. I wasn't even close to fine, but I had no idea how to explain what had happened, or what Emery did to me. All this time, I'd been defending her. Now, I wondered how much of a blind idiot I'd been. Or Gentry, for that matter. I trusted him when he said she hadn't done anything suspicious. What she did to me, that shouldn't have been possible, but it was. The mark one thought I saw on her neck had to be there. Julian asked if we should get going on the rest of our route before the sun came up. I was going to say yes when I turned and spotted the classroom door Emery had glanced at. I motioned Julian to go on ahead and blurred to the classroom, ignoring his protests. The door was unlocked, and I threw it open, flipping on the light, unsure of what I was looking for. There were tables and chairs set up in rows. I was about to leave until I turned around and saw the far corner of the room. Growing out of the hardwood floor and through the stone walls were vines, and on them were black irises. Those flowers didn't vine but there they were, curling in on themselves while they died one by one until there were none left. Their sweet scent lingered in the room, accompanied by another smell. Apples, I whispered, reaching for one of the dying flowers. The black petals dried out in my hand, breaking apart until nothing was left but a small pile of black ash in my palm. The scent, the irises, the tattoos on her right arm and the damn birthmark on her neck. She must have used magic to hide it after I saw it that day. Hissing curses, I exited the classroom, finished my route with Julian who had waited for me in the foyer, and rushed up to my apartment. Thoughts chased each other in my head, making the headache Emery left me with a hundred times worse. I didn't know the signs of death magic as well as Gentry did, but I remembered enough to be concerned. Then there was the odd behavior I'd witnessed a few times where she seemed to be looking at something behind me, as if she sensed a spirit. Add that to what Gentry had seen her research in the library, and my mind came to the only logical conclusion. She's a necromancer, I whispered to my empty living room. Gentry's suspicions were right the whole time. Throwing my head back with an aggravated snarl, I stomped to my study and sank into my chair. He finally found someone he could talk to and be around, 
and she turned out to wield the worst magic possible. How the hell was I supposed to tell him all of this? To confirm what I didn't think he wanted to hear. He was already unstable. This confirmation would push him over the edge without question. I glared at the walls around me, hating that this problem had been dumped on me. Well now, don't you look like you're having a great morning. I spun around to face the full-length mirror, forcing a smile for Teresa. I've had worse. She laughed, a sultry sound that came with a heartfelt smile. It wasn't hard to realize why Roderick had picked her to be his ruling consort, or why he'd fallen in love with her. She was astounding for far more than her looks. And she had treated me like a son since the moment Roderick turned me. She had become in essence my mother, just as he'd become my father. Spill, she ordered, resting her hands on her hips and pinning me with one of her typical gazes that said I wasn't going to get away from this conversation. What's going on with you? You make it sound like I'm having a breakdown. I haven't heard from you in weeks, and neither has your father. That's not like you. The murders have been keeping me occupied. Her brown gaze turned worried. You're watching out for yourself, yes? Yes? Good. What else is bothering you? I tap my fingers on my desk, avoiding her gaze. I have a problem, and I'm not entirely certain how to address it. The last thing I was going to do was tell Teresa about Emery. I needed to know without a doubt she was a necromancer and involved with these murders. If I turned out to be overreacting, I'd be putting Emery through an ordeal she'd probably never get over. The rumors would spread, and she'd be tainted even if she turned out to be innocent. And? Does this problem have to do with a certain young woman you've recently met? I rolled my eyes. Why does he have to tell you everything? Ah, so it is about her. What did you do? Who said I did anything? That pained look on your face, she quipped. I didn't, I argued. But I found out something about her, and it changes things. She's ah, uh, she's actually dating Gentry. Wilson, she asked surprised. He's seeing someone? He is, but I'm afraid she's turning out not to be who I thought and I don't want her to hurt him. And you want to tell him this, but you're not sure how. She seemed to mull over a reply, and finally shook her head. How bad is it? What you found out? Potentially catastrophic, I muttered without thinking, then grimaced. Teresa's stare turned calculating. Alistair, how serious is this? Is she trouble, this witch? No, nothing like that, I lied, being careful to not move a muscle. Usually, I would tell you to stay out of other people's relationships, she said, holding up her hand. However, seeing as it's gentry, and we all know what he endured, having this witch break his heart will hurt him deeply. If you're this worried about him, talk to him. He might get pissed, but it's far better than being blindsided. She was right. Now all I had to do was figure out how to tell gentry the witch he let himself get close to was not who she seemed to be. I was hoping to speak with you on a separate matter, Teresa said, wringing her hands. She never wrung her hands. Ever. What's wrong? I asked, pushing to my feet. Roderick? He's all right, but he was called back to Burning Glade for a special session. Are they still working on those new laws of protection? No, she whispered, glancing over her shoulder. When she faced me again, her face was pinched and she buried her hands in the folds of her black skirt stopping their fidgeting. A member of the Eternal Ember was murdered yesterday. Who? A vampire? A witch? Clara Flanagan. That was odd, but it'd be even stranger, I speculated, if it were a vampire killed in the same manner as those here. Has Jana been informed yet? I think her father is showing up today with the news. Clara was found with her throat slashed. She'd stayed behind in Burning Glade to speak with several representatives from smaller factions. They said she missed her meeting. One of her assistants went to check on her and found her. Any leads? None so far, but the Covens are in an uproar over it. They believe it has something to do with the death magic laws. But she was against them, wasn't she? Teresa nodded. 
I'm not sure what they're thinking, but now they have to find a replacement before the end of the year. No decisions can be made until the seat's filled. They're meeting to investigate her death and calm the waters before there's a riot at the Capitol. I studied her eyes and the fear that had trickled in to join the worry. Are you afraid for Roderick? The last time there was a murder in the Capitol like this, the necromancers were involved, she whispered. And vampires are being killed at Academy. They have no leads, none. Yes, I'm afraid. This was how it started last time. They targeted the Ember, and then they went after the vampires. It's been decades though. Why attack now when they're no longer being hunted? I don't know but I don't trust them. Any of them. My thoughts went straight to Emery, and tried to imagine her being the dealer of death of those here. Her reaction to finding the murdered student could have been faked, but it was hard to know for sure. And Gentry had said she was sick at the sight of the third victim. Could she really be the killer? Or was it merely a coincidence she was here at the same time the murderer was? Too many questions without answers rampaged through my head, and I winced as the headache returned. If anything changes, I'll contact you again, Teresa said. Until then, be careful, please. I will promise. She smiled briefly, and her image faded, leaving me staring at my reflection. Chapter 11 Alistair After my latest run-in with Emery, I awoke every day, telling myself to find Gentry and explain what I saw. And every day, I talked myself out of it at the last second. Watching him and Emery from a safe distance had left me torn and hating that I'd been put in this position. They laughed together, and he was even holding her hand. She was the first person to make him smile since Kylie, and here I was about to ruin everything. I wanted to speak with Emery again first, to get her to tell me the truth, but she successfully managed to avoid me. I was running out of time. Where that thought came from, I hadn't a clue, but it was like a clock ticking down in my head, warning me that something was coming, something that was going to change the world. I needed to tell Gentry he was right. What are you watching so intently? Julian asked, joining me in the breezeway. Nothing, I lied while Gentry and Emery parted ways across the gardens. Did you need something? Unfortunately, I come bearing bad news, he whispered and motioned me to walk with him. We entered an empty classroom, and he locked the door. Fairmain's going to call another faculty meeting for tomorrow night. Did the guard find out something involving the murders? Worse. They found another body an hour ago. Where? Greenhouse. Discovered by two professors during their rounds. A growl accompanied his words. A vampire, killed the same way as the others. He was a student, first year here. Shit. Did they find anything odd with the body? Flowers? Julian gave me an odd look. Flowers? He was in the greenhouse. I meant flowers that didn't belong. Or maybe markings on him. He started to shake his head then stopped. Wait, there was something. I overheard the guardsmen talking about it when they were discreetly removing the body. He tapped his right wrist. There was a burn on his arm about here. Said it looked like a lily. No, sorry. Iris. An iris. The tattoo on the back of Emery's neck appeared in my mind's eye. What about the other victims? Do we know if they had the mark too? No idea, Alistair. Where are you going? I left him without responding, and rushed out the door to find Gentry. Time was up. At this time he'd be teaching a class but this couldn't wait. I reached his room and threw open the door. Professor Wilson, I called from the door, bringing his lecture to a halt. A word if you please. Gentry waved his arm, motioning to the room full of students. I'm in the middle of a lecture. It can't wait, I'm sorry. I backed out of the room, holding the door open for him. He told his class to discuss the lecture and join me in the hall. Grabbing him by the arm, I tugged him down the hall until I found an empty room to shove him in. What is wrong with you? He snapped, tearing himself free. Have you lost your mind? A fourth body was found an hour ago, 
I blurted. Vampire? Yeah, student, but it's worse. I threw my head back, wishing there was an easier way to tell him about Emery, but being blunt was probably for the best. He had a burn on his arm, an iris. Gentry crossed his arms. And? So what? I have to tell you something, and you're not going to like it. About Emery. His eyes flared red and he hissed. Explain. Now. Knowing there was no right way to say any of it, I went into a quick explanation of what I saw the other night when I caught her in the hallway. His eyes glowed brighter with every word I said. When I fell quiet, his hands dropped to his sides, and he paced around the perimeter of the room, growling. Why are you doing this to me? He rasped. Doing what? Gentry, I'm trying to tell you, you were right about her. I don't believe you. What? I said I don't believe you. It can't be real. What you saw, it just can't be, he muttered, his tone pleading. I've been with her this whole time, and there's been nothing suspicious or strange. You sure you're not simply blinded by your feelings for her? He growled viciously and stomped to the other end of the room. A desk went flying into the wall, followed by a chair and the table next. I've gotten close to her, he whispered. She calms me down and makes me feel again. The anger that was threatening to tear me apart, she soothes it somehow, and not by using magic. She's told me things about her past, and I feel like I know her. Is she telling you the truth? Yeah, he said, then hesitated. There's something she's holding back, but it can't be this. I'm afraid it is. What she did, forcing me to stop moving, we both know what that means. The birthmark has been there this whole time. She simply hid it. I moved toward him but stopped, hating to witness him so confused and torn. I'm sorry. You've been hurting since the attack, carrying around the guilt and this anger. She could merely be taking advantage of how emotionally vulnerable you are. He squared his shoulders and pinned me with a furious glare. Or you're telling me all this to get me to turn on her. Why the hell would I do that? Why would I lie? You're jealous. I rolled my eyes. Yeah, you caught me. I'm making up seeing the tattoos and having my body controlled because I'm jealous. I scoffed and sighed. I want to be happy for you, I stated, and he grunted in disbelief. I wanted this to work with you and her, but these are the facts. She's not who she says she is. This wasn't the reaction I expected from Gentry. He hadn't merely gotten close to Emery while trying to figure out who she was. He'd fallen for her, hard. The struggle was evident in the angry glare that showed he wanted more than anything for me to be wrong. His hand clenched into a fist and I braced my feet, waiting for the strike. I can't believe you, he whispered, his body slumping forward. Then ask her what she's hiding. Maybe I am wrong. I hope I'm wrong but if I'm not, I added, we need to do something. If she does have death magic, there's a high probability she's connected to these murders. Gentry walked past me to the door. Where are you going? Back to my class. Gentry. He held up his hand. I'll talk to her. I'm just praying you're wrong. He took a moment to compose his face and marched out the door, slamming it shut behind him so hard several glass panes fell out and shattered on the floor. I kicked a desk sending it careening across the room. That conversation had not gone as planned. Not even close. Chapter 12 Gentry I snarled myself awake, kicking furiously at the blankets when they tangled around my legs. Running my hands down my face, I snarled in the darkness of my room, slipped from the bed and stormed from one end to the other until the last of the screams in my mind died. My hands clenched at my sides and I nearly punched the wall. My fist stopped a breath away from cracking the wall. I'd done well controlling my anger. Now suddenly, it was like I was back to being the pissed off, out of control vampire who'd watched his family torn to shreds. Everything Alistair said to me yesterday came back in a rush, and I hated him all over again. I lowered my fist and shut my eyes. An image of the woman I once gave my heart to appeared. Her smiling face helped me relax until the vision shifted and she was covered in blood. Her scream, while she was torn apart, 
forced me to my knees and I clenched at my head, trying to make it go away. When the living nightmare persisted, I staggered from my bedroom to the kitchen, scrambling to grab the bottle of whiskey blood. I unscrewed the cap and drained half of it. Sitting on the floor in the small kitchenette, I glared at the living room wall with no idea how much time passed. The empty bottle rolled from my hand, startling me out of my daze. An alarm was going off in my bedroom. Annoyed, I climbed to my feet, hurrying to turn it off. Not showing up for class this evening sounded like a great plan, what with how little sleep I'd gotten last night. The nightmare I'd had in the library kept coming back. Each time it was the same. I'd watch Kylie approach, bearing the wounds from that wretched night. She'd speak to me, saying the same words over and over, until I thought I was going to lose it. Emery is the key. Protect her. But how could she be the key if she was a necromancer? Why did Kylie believe I would protect her? And protect her from whom, Alistair? Or did she mean me? I grabbed my head, my eyes shutting tight at the headache from too many questions rolling around in my skull. Key! I grumbled, glaring at my mirror when I made it to the bathroom and flipped on the light. Key to what? For what? All I wanted were straight answers. I highly doubted I'd get those anytime soon. After classes ended last night, I'd come straight to my room. Getting my head on a straight was a must, before I broached the topic with Emery. I scowled, not wanting to believe Alistair, but there was no reason for him to lie, not about an issue this serious. I gripped the sink, hanging my head. She's not the killer. She can't be. The last thing I could see Emery doing is killing an innocent but her family had been attacked by vampires. It wasn't impossible she'd held on to that anger this long. Hell, I was a prime example of how long a person could hold a grudge. I tried picturing Emery attacking the vampires, but everything about those scenarios was wrong. Just ask her, I told myself sternly. You have to know the truth before anyone else dies. I splashed water on my face, ran my fingers through my hair, but gave up on attempting to appear any better. There was nothing I could do about the dark circles under my eyes. Nothing about today was going to be good. Not one damn thing. While I dressed, the last time I was with Emery rushed to my mind. We'd been in our place and not said a word. There was never a need to talk while we were together. Simply being there was enough for us both. We'd been on the couch, with her furiously writing away in her notebook, while I spent more time studying her than reading. She liked to fiddle with her necklace when she was concentrating. Her right eye would twitch any time she grew annoyed. She'd scratch out a line or two of what she'd jotted down. And shoes. She hated shoes. She always wore slip-ons so she could kick them off once she was at our special spot. Made her feet ungodly cold. I smirked, thinking about her shoving them under my leg to warm them even though I was a vampire. I tickled them, and before long, our laughter gave way to a kiss. She'd fallen asleep that night with her head in my lap, her notebook forgotten on the floor. The comfort from merely thinking about her slipped away when Alistair's words came back to me. She'd opened up about her past, and I'd been surprised to hear myself slowly telling her more about myself. I hadn't shared the night my house was attacked, but she seemed to always know when I was thinking about it. Her hand would appear in mine, and would stay there until one of us had to leave. Maybe not knowing the truth would be better. I was close to letting down the walls I'd put up so many decades before. Being near Emery was why I could function on my darkest days when the memories were too much to handle. Not that she knew exactly what she did for me. I hadn't scrounged up the nerve to confess how dark my own past was, or how much it tormented me to this day. The faintest touch of a hand cupping my cheek threw me back in time. Kylie, I whispered but she wasn't here. She never would be, unless it was in my nightmares, nightmares I no longer understood. Remember why you started this, I said sternly, grabbing the doorknob. Just ask her for the truth. You can't make any decisions until you know the truth. I had a job to do, and I was going to see it through, no matter the consequences. Marching out my apartment, I made my way quickly to the library, knowing Emery would be there by now. On the fourth floor, I slowed, 
still working out what I would say to her. A few times over the last few weeks when I'd get here, I'd swear she was talking to someone else. But every time I walked in, she was alone. Today, as I approached the room, I listened intently. Her voice flowed out of the room, and the anger I'd awakened with which has left me raw and hurting was soothed. She asked a question, but there was no audible response. Hoping to catch her in the act of doing something today, I blurred to the doorway, staying within the shadows, expecting to catch sight of someone. It was only Emery sitting on the couch, her feet pulled up beneath her. She hadn't seen me yet, or if she had, she'd decided not to say anything. She had a lock of hair wrapped around her finger, while she jotted down something in the leather journal she carried around. Her black sweater hung off her left shoulder and had a grayish-white raven on it. She chewed on her cheek, pausing in her writing. Her off-white slip-on sneakers rested on the rug by the couch. She really had made this room a home away from home for herself. The room blurred for a second. I no longer saw Emery on the couch, but Kylie, back in what had been our small cabin. She'd been happy, we both had been. We were young vampires, ready to embrace all our new lives had to offer. Then she was stolen from me. A snarl slipped from my mouth, echoing down the corridor. Gentry. Is that you? Emery asked, breaking the spell the past had placed on me. Kylie wasn't in front of me anymore. I strolled into the room. Hey, I said, unable to even force a fake smile for her benefit. You okay? she asked, her brow knitted together. Great. Why? Her eyes filled with worry, emerald eyes that I'd seen so much in my dreams lately. You seem pissed. You haven't stopped growling since you walked in. Shit, she was right. Get it together, man, just get it together. I'm fine, promise, but there is something I've been meaning to ask you. She closed her journal and tucked it in her tote bag. Why do I feel like this isn't going to be a fun conversation? She reached for my hand and I let her take it. Is it about us? If we're moving too fast or whatever, you can tell me. Or if this isn't working, she added, pulling her hand back until I caught it. No, it's not that. I ran my thumb over her knuckles, failing to figure out how to get the words out. A while back, you said something about how it was a mistake to come here that you were worried about messing things up. I held onto her hand when I sensed her withdrawing. What did you mean by that? It's nothing. You can trust me, I said, making my voice sincere. Does it have anything to do with your talking to yourself? She frowned and I shrugged. Vampire hearing. A few times when I've come to meet you here, it sounds like you're talking to someone else, but you're alone. She kept her gaze lowered. I'm never alone. What? She ripped her hand free and rose from the couch. There are things I can't tell you yet. I want to, but you wouldn't understand. You probably never will, and I'm an idiot for thinking you might, she whispered, her voice shaking so badly she tripped over her words. I, she cleared her throat. I can't do this. Not yet. Not with all this shit going on. My heart sank at her words. I rose and went to her, but she rushed away, keeping one of the armchairs between us. I knew this was a bad idea. Her hand curled against her chest. She winced. Damn it. Emery? I said, but she went to the couch and slipped on her shoes, grabbed her bag and ran for the door. I caught her at the last second and spun her around to face me. The fear that had been so prevalent when we first met had crept back into her panicked eyes. Tears shimmered in her eyes, and I hugged her. I'm sorry, I whispered. I didn't mean to upset you. I understand you need time, I do. But I'm here for you. Remember that. She buried her face in my shirt, sniffing hard. I know. If we'd had this conversation weeks ago, I would have pushed until she broke and confessed whatever it was she was hiding. But I'd grown too close to her to do that now. I wasn't sure who I hated more right then, myself or Alistair. I lifted Emery's hair from her shoulder, running my fingers through. I spotted the tattoo on her right shoulder. The design flickered in and out of sight. The spell she used to cover it must be affected by her emotions. 
I narrowed my eyes at the sight of a raven with its half-alive, half-dead skeletal appearance. Keeping her in my arms, I slid my right hand up her arm to her bared shoulder. Her skin was freezing. A heaviness settled on my shoulders until I pulled my hand back. Death magic. I swallowed down the snarl of anger at her lies and composed my face. When I stepped back, letting her go, she wiped at her eyes and attempted a smile. I'll see you later. She walked off and the small room closed in around me. The whiskey I would chugged when I woke up sat heavy in my stomach. I stumbled back at the sharp stab of pain in the center of my chest. This whole time she'd lied to me. The story about her parents being attacked by vampires, was that even real? That scar on her neck could be from anything. The past weeks with Emery disintegrated before me. Snarling, I blurred from the library, through the courtyard, and out one of the side gates to the orchard. With a murderer on the loose, I shouldn't have been alone, but the building felt too constricting. I couldn't breathe in there. Hell, I could barely breathe out here. With a roar, I ran my hands madly through my hair. Clasping them around the back of my head, I prowled under the trees like a wild beast, needing to rip something apart. My fangs protruded from my gums. I hissed at the full moon, blocking out the light of the stars. Nothing made sense anymore. How was that even possible? I'd been around Emery for what, two months, and she had me twisted in knots so bad, I had no idea which way was up anymore. Protect her. I snarled at the sound of Kylie's voice, yelling at her to shut up. She didn't need protection. I had to protect everyone else from her. Just leave me alone, I shouted to the night sky. You're dead. You don't get to tell me what to do. Gentry. I whirled around at the sound of Alistair's voice. What are you doing out here? Saw you sprint out here. He rested his shoulder against a tree and crossed his arms. You talked to Emery, I take it? I growled, but I hadn't been able to intimidate him for a long time. And this occasion was no different. Just go away. I'll take that as a yes. I'm sorry man, for what it's worth. Is it bad? I whipped around and punched one of the apple trees. The trunk exploded into splinters, and the rest of it toppled over with a loud crash. Alistair's lips thinned. I can't remember the last time you lost your anger like this. The punch let me release some of my rage, but not all of it. Didn't do a damn thing for the confusion. Emery, I spat pacing again. You were right. We both were. She has death magic. She's a damn necromancer. You're sure? I nailed him with a glare. Of course I was sure. He held up his hands. My hands were shaking with rage as I explained it to him. I felt it, and she freaked out when I started to push her for answers. What am I supposed to do? He grimaced. Our first move should be to see if she's involved in the murders. And then... He rested his shoulder on a nearby tree, light eyes paling even more with regret. What do you think we should do? In my mind, I replayed my time with Emery, searching for a moment, any moment, when she might have hinted that she wasn't who she said. A moment she'd showed her true colors as a manipulator, or a liar. Her loner personality sucked me in, and everything she said about her life, about her parents, only dragged me in deeper. I thought I'd found a kind-hearted soul. Instead, she'd probably used me the whole time to help keep her cover. They're all the same in the end, I whispered roughly. All the same. She can't be allowed to stay here, involved in the murders or not. I can notify the guard, Alistair suggested. I shook my head. We do this my way. I want her to confess the truth to my face. Then we can hand her over to the guard. The walls Emery started to dismantle went right back up, stronger than before. Kylie's words whispered against my ear but my snarl tuned them out. Emery had her chance to tell me the truth. I'd speak with her one last time and never see her again. Let's get this over with. I led the way back to the academy, doing everything I could to forget the warmth left behind by Emery's arms around me, or her lips on mine. Too late, it was too damn late. Chapter 13 Emery
The note had been stuck to my door when I went to turn in for the night. I recognized Gentry's handwriting and wondered why he wanted to meet me at our place this early in the morning. Exhausted and unsure if I was ready to face him after our last conversation, I decided it'd be better to get it over with. I tossed my tote inside my room and trudged through the building to the library. I saw no one on my way to the fourth floor and walked quickly to the small study room. But when I stepped inside, it wasn't Gentry standing at the fireplace to greet me. Alistair? What are you doing here? The stern set to his face and the glint of anger in his eyes made me take a step back. A presence behind me made my blood run cold. I glanced over my shoulder, jumping when I saw Gentry blocking the door. What is this? I demanded, looking from him to Alistair. We know, Alistair answered when Gentry said nothing. About what? My hands shook, glowing subtly as I drew on my magic. Gentry's brow was furrowed, and his eyes flared red at the sight of my magic. His lip lifted in a disgusted snarl while he growled. The harsh noise I'd never heard from him wasn't what had my heart pounding and a rush of anger rising within me. It was the hatred staring back at me from those dark brown depths. The gentry I'd gotten to know that I'd opened up to, who I came to trust, was gone. There wasn't a hint of him anywhere in that stare. A flashback to those terrifying three days trapped in my house with drunk blood vampires, hell bent on tearing me apart, rooted me to the spot. My magic flared to life. Gentry bared his fangs in a warning. I'm walking out of this room, I told Gentry, wishing my voice wasn't so shaky. I suggest you move. Not until you tell us the truth. Gentry took a step closer, and I instinctively backed away. His eye twitched, but the coldness in his gaze didn't dissipate. Are you a necromancer? No, I said, squaring my shoulders. You're lying. Prove it. I saw your tattoos, he said, his eyes flicking to my right arm, and the mark on the back of your neck. I don't have any tattoos. The words were barely out of my mouth when cool air hit my now bare right arm. The sleeve of my black shirt hung from Gentry's fist. The illusion I'd placed on my body for the day was fading. I attempted to restore it, but glass shattered at my feet and swirling blue smoke circled my body, short-circuiting my magic. The illusion broke, allowing my three guides, the raven, the hare, and the owl, to appear. Gentry dropped the torn sleeve and scowled. I glowered at Alistair, who had thrown the potion. His eyes weren't as cold as Gentry's, but he wasn't exactly on my side either. You lied to me. Gentry said, his voice thick with his growl. Why? There was no hiding the truth now, but I wasn't about to stand there and explain myself to him. Why did you lie to me? He repeated, louder this time. Were you purposely trying to get close to me, so you could take advantage of who I am? So you could kill me like you did the others? What the hell are you talking about? Do you even hear what's coming out of your mouth? You killed those vampires, he ranted, and my jaw dropped. Admit it. You have death magic, and they found out somehow, and you killed them. You're exactly like the others. Heartless cold. That's all you are, a mindless killer who. My hand moved on its own. The resounding crack of it striking Gentry's face hurt my ears. My chest heaved in anger. I slapped him a second time, sending his head flying to the right. How dare you stand there and call me those things, I whispered furiously. I didn't kill anyone. I tried to help them, and you, you really think after spending all this time with me that I could do that? That I could kill innocents so brutally? He stretched his face and turned to me, his eyes glowing bright red. A tiny sliver of the gentry I thought I knew appeared. You have death magic. They were killed by it. And that automatically makes me a killer? I shouted. You stand there and say I'm just like all the others? Well so are you, sunshine. Accusing me of crimes I didn't commit, because of what? Ha! Huh. What proof do you have it was me? Black irises were found at the scenes, he informed me. And the latest victim had one burned into his arm. I held my hands to my head, staring at him wide-eyed in disbelief. That's it? Are you kidding me right now? Everyone touched by death magic would leave behind irises. 
and the burn? Alistair asked. I don't know anything about branding people, and I'm not going to be interrogated like this another second. Move, I ordered Gentry. Now. He squared his shoulders, blocking the doorway with his size. Not until you admit the truth. I don't owe you anything. Move aside. The potion Alistair used to block my magic was fading fast. A dark green glow pulsed in my palms while it fought to return to its full strength. Falling apart sounded like a great idea, but I wasn't about to do it in front of them. I sure as hell wasn't going to let Gentry see how much this hurt. I thought I'd found a friend, someone I could trust, and here he was accusing me of murder, all because of the magic I possessed. I steeled my nerves, telling myself he was nothing to me. He was a vampire, and no matter what any of us did, my kind would always be the enemy. Gentry, I whispered, my knees wobbly until I locked them. Don't do this. Please. A tick started at his brow, and his hands twitched at his sides. The red of his eyes faded slightly, and his lips parted like he was about to speak. A black shadow parted from the wall behind him. The raven on my shoulder fluttered his wings, trying to get my attention. A second figure appeared behind Gentry, and I reacted on instinct. With a snap of the fingers on my left hand, I shoved Gentry away from the door and thrust out my right. A burst of green light lit the corridor, and the six figures crowding it. Two of them were hit by the blast, and yet a small cylindrical object rolled into the room. White smoke poured out and filled the small space in seconds. Alistair and Gentry collapsed, coughing and hissing. I sank to my knees, my vision blurred. Heavy steps approached while I fought to stay awake. I spotted the hem of a black cloak when I slipped into unconsciousness. Voices murmured nearby, and I jerked upright. Chains rattled, and heavy manacles weighed down my wrists. Seriously? I sat up slowly, gasping at my throbbing head. The ground was hard beneath me, and obviously not hardwood. Tree branches creaked and groaned overhead while dead leaves fluttered through the air. A soft snarl to my right pulled my gaze. Alistair and Gentry sat close by, their wrists also chained but with silver. Their eyes were red in the darkness, the only light aside from a large bonfire about twenty yards away from us. Cloaked figures huddled together in small clusters. I stopped counting at twenty. There was nothing to tell me who they were or why they'd been in the library. What happened? I asked, cringing because talking caused my head to ache worse. You tell us, Gentry said, growling. How should I know? I held up my manacled hands, rattling the chain loudly. They took me too, if you hadn't noticed. They've been talking, Alistair said, shooting Gentry a look I didn't fully understand. It's too quiet for me to pick up anything helpful. We're not that far from the academy. How did they even get in the school? Or get us out? Don't act like you don't know, Gentry spat, attempting to break the manacles, but all they did was burn his skin. He hissed, trying again until Alistair snapped at him to stop. What? We have to alert the guard. She probably set this up as her way to escape the academy before she was discovered. I tried to save you, remember? I couldn't believe this was happening. You're insane. Absolutely insane. What did you call me? Insane, I said louder, not backing down from his glare. You know, I can't decide what's worse, the fact that you're clearly delusional or the fact that I let myself fall for you. The confession startled me. Gentry blinked, the harsh glow fading from his eyes. A bitter laugh slipped from my mouth while I wondered how I got myself into this situation. For once in my life, I let down my guard and look what happened. I was going to tell you. I was going to tell you everything because you said I could trust you. And I did, I whispered angrily wiping at the tears falling down my cheeks. I trusted you so much I was going to tell you what I really was. I know I'm not supposed to be here, but I need answers because there's no one out there to help me. And you, I rolled my eyes skyward telling myself to shut up, but the words kept coming, you reminded me why it's safer not to trust anyone, especially a damned vampire. If you trusted me so much, then why lie? Everything you told me, none of it was real. Which part? I argued. 
The part where my dad was nearly killed from having his throat slit by a blood-drunk vampire? Or my mom being tortured to the point where she lost her sanity and tried to kill me? I yanked up my shirt, revealing the massive scar on my right side, the skin twisted and puckered. Or how those same vampires tried to rip the death magic out of me. Which part isn't true, Gentry? Tell me please. I'd love to know. Alistair cursed quietly, his eyes glued to the massive scar. The night your family was attacked, they were looking for others like you, weren't they? I dropped my shirt. Yeah, and they found me. A seven-year-old child. How did they know? Alistair asked while Gentry's face remained set in stone, his gaze fixed on my torso still. Someone had seen me speaking with the spirit in the woods, I replied quietly. It was the first time I entered the spirit realm. I had no idea I'd even done it. And the other night, when I ran into you and that witch. Rose? She's my friend but we tell everyone we're cousins, I admitted. I was looking for the real killer. I stared at Gentry while I spoke, unsure why I cared so much if he believed me or not. I went into the spirit realm to speak with the victims. And? Alistair questioned. I gulped, knowing how bad this was about to sound. And they were killed by someone with death magic. Gentry grunted, and my magic burst to life at my hands. If you accuse me of murder one more time, you're going to regret it, I warned. The death magic wasn't like death magic. It was dark, evil. All death magic is. No, it's not. Tell me, the whole time we were together, did you ever sense evil in me? Ever? His silence was answer enough. Whoever killed them is powerful enough to hex their spirits. I tried to help them move on, but they're trapped at the academy. I didn't want to tell them that part, but they needed to know who they are dealing with if we made it back to the academy alive. The person forced the vampires to tear their own hearts out. They, ah, uh, they probably have the same birthmark you saw on me. Gentry's laugh was nothing like what I'd heard from him over the last few weeks. It was dark and unsettled me. It's you, Emery. Stop denying it. You killed those vampires, and you're doing all of this now to throw off suspicion. Yeah. I'm telling you everything I found because I did it, I muttered, and his laughter stopped abruptly. You're an asshole, you know that? Alistair was right. I should have stayed away from you. Yeah, you should have. His words cut me deep, and I flinched at the disgust glaring back at me. He'd never believe a word I said. I didn't want to care, but I did, which only increased my level of hatred for him. How did I ever think I could be with a vampire like him? Something's happening, Alistair said, nodding toward the clearing. What is that? Emery should know. These are probably her people, coming to. Shut up, I uttered. Gentry's mouth snapped closed instantly. I blinked surprised and confused. I'd done the same thing to Alistair the other night, without meaning to. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I broke eye contact and his jaw dropped open. Sure you didn't. Gentry kept glaring. I turned away, attempting to figure out what the totem was by the bonfire. The cloaked figures pushed it up and hammered stakes into the ground to keep it upright. There were carvings on it, but the flickering firelight made them hard to make out. The raven's wings fluttered on my shoulder, and the urge to get far away from this place made me work at the manacles on my wrists. We need to leave, I told the others. Now. What is that? Alistair asked. I shook my head. No idea but it's not good. Sorry to keep you waiting, a deep voice announced. I froze. A shifter flanked by a vampire and someone else, possibly a witch, approached, hands clasped in front of them. Takes a while to get everything set up. Now then, sounded like you were having quite the conversation. Care to share? You did it, didn't you? I stated. Did what? Kidnapped you? Yes, we did to that, the shifter said, chuckling menacingly. I would not be deterred. Killed the vampires. One of you has death magic. I'm afraid I have no idea what you're talking about. We haven't killed anyone. Yet. 
He raised his right hand to run his fingers through his black beard, and I spotted a brand on the back of his hand. It shimmered in and out of sight, an illusion spell. I squinted, memorizing what details I could, until the shifter snapped his fingers. The two cloaked figures with him snatched me by the arms and yanked me to my feet. Get your hands off me, I yelled. The shifter grabbed the heavy chain and yanked me to him. His hot breath reeked of blood making me gag. You are our guest of honor tonight. He trailed his fingers down my cheek. I attempted to bite him, and he backhanded me hard enough for stars to appear in my vision. Growling came from behind me, but I knew it couldn't be from Alistair or Gentry. They could have cared less what happened to me. The shifter rubbed his hands together. It's a shame, really. You've got some fight in you. Screw you, asshole. He hit me a second time, and I gasped at the stinging pain. Once we take care of you, we'll get rid of the extra one. She has no need for him. Take her. Extra one? I had a split second to be confused by his words before he shoved me into the waiting arms of three others. No, get away from me, I shouted, kicking and tugging at my hands. The shifter cackled behind me, the sound following me all the way to the strange totem of stone. I narrowed my eyes, studying the sigils. What was happening clicked. I screamed, fighting harder to get away, but they took the chain and attached it to the totem. With one hard tug, my back was flattened against the freezing cold stone. Those sigils came from death magic, but someone had twisted them around. The raven on my shoulder fluttered frantically, wanting me to flee, but there was nothing I could do. Whatever magic was infused within this totem was powerful and evil. My skin crawled at the mere presence of it, and I fought the urge to be sick. Through the crowd of cloaked strangers I spotted Gentry and Alistair. The first time I'd ever thought I was going to die, I'd been with my family. At the age of seven, deep down, I'd been okay with that knowledge. Here in this clearing, feeling my death closing in once again, I wondered at how cruel fate was. I was going to be killed, surrounded by enemies and a vampire who'd stabbed me in the back. A vampire I thought would be on my side after he learned the truth. Hope and optimism were pointless. All they ever led to was disappointment. Prepare the spell, the shifter yelled. The totem behind me warmed, the sigils pulsing with dark magic. I yanked on the manacles, gritting my teeth at the pain from the metal digging into my skin. All I had to do was slip free. Get free and get out of here. A chant erupted from the group who had clasped hands and formed circles. Their heads bowed, and a rumbling growl came from the stone. The ground rumbled when an explosion of violet light shot from the totem. A scream tore free of my throat at the sickening sensation of claws digging into my chest. The light faded, and I sucked in a shuddering breath, barely able to stand on quaking legs. Blood dripped from my nose, splattering my sneakers. A second rumble started, and I gripped the chain hard, willing the links to break. But they didn't. A second burst slammed me into the totem. My scream echoed through the clearing. Chapter 14 Gentry I snarled as Emery's scream ripped through me. The silver manacles biting into my skin while I strained to get to her. When the shifter hauled her away, I told myself I felt nothing for her. Not one damn thing. Then he'd struck her and I'd growled, pushing to my feet. She was a necromancer, she had death magic, even admitted it to us. That should have been enough to squash any feelings I had for her. The deceit I had thought was in her gaze wasn't. She wasn't a murderer, and whoever these people were, they obviously hadn't come to take her away to keep her safe. Protect her, Kylie's voice whispered in my ear. Decades of pent-up anger toward any and all with death magic was shoved aside when Emery screamed a second time. The violet light faded. She sagged in the chains. Blood dripped from her nose and she shook her head while her lips moved. She was begging for them to stop, but the chant the cloaked figures recited only grew louder. The pulsing started again and Emery cringed, weakly pulling at her wrists. The time between bursts grew shorter. When she let out a shriek of agony for the third time, I shouted, enraged, thrown back to another night, long ago, when I'd watched the woman I cared for being ripped apart. We have to stop this, I said, growling. 
My muscles bulged, but nothing I did broke the enchantment on the chains preventing me from saving Emery. Alistair examined the links attached to a heavy silver ring, driven into the ground. Move in front of me, he ordered quietly. Do it quick. Can you break it? I asked, not letting my eyes leave Emery. Her head fell forward. She's running out of time. Give me a second. She doesn't have a second, I said, my words clipped. The pulsing was already starting again. Alistair let out a quiet, triumphant whisper. The chains glowed for a second then snapped, freeing us from the ground. The manacles continued to burn into my wrists, but I used that pain to fuel my anger. Emery. I had to get to Emery. Alistair gave me a nod, and together we blurred to the first line of cloaked figures. We burst through the line, knocking them off their feet and throwing them into the trees. The chanting continued, as those in the next circle spun around and attacked. I threw a shifter off my back and kicked out another's legs, driving him to the ground with a punch to the gut. I left him gasping and whirled around, catching a fist to the jaw. Shaking my head to clear it, I dodged the second blow aimed for my jaw and grabbed the witch's arm, twisting. He yelped as I threw him into a massive tree trunk. He sank to the ground in an unconscious heap. A shifter flew over my head. I ducked, spinning around in time to spot Alistair grabbing another one by his throat. A punch to my back sent me staggering forward. I dodged at the last second and avoided a blast of violet magic from striking me dead center. Rolling to my feet I blurred into the witch, and she screamed until she crashed into another tree, smashing the trunk, then slumping forward. Two vampires lunged for me, snagging my arms. I snapped my fangs at them, but two more piled on top of me, driving me to the ground. Alistair bellowed. He too was tackled. I dug my fingers into the dirt, straining to get out from under their weight. A witch approached, a small ball of reddish light forming between her hands. She smirked darkly at me, raising her hands over her head. I guess you don't get to see the end of the show. Too bad, she said. You sure this is the right one? One of the vampires pinning me down asked. Of course I am, she replied. I had no idea what they were talking about. Right one for what? The witch raised her arms higher. I yelled, not willing to give up the fight. A loud rumbling growl came from the totem but this time there was no scream from Emery. A fierce animalistic roar tore through the hollow. The witch whirled around. The chanting of her companions came to a quick halt. The violet light from the totem faded. A second roar sent a shockwave of energy slamming into us. The vampires holding me were thrown off while I frantically grabbed hold of clumps of grass and weeds to keep myself in place. The energy faded. I lifted my head, confused. Emery stood in front of the totem, but her face was white, like a skull. Black circles surrounded her glowing green eyes, and her cheeks appeared sunk in. Her death magic took control of her, much as it had the necromancers who'd attacked my family. But unlike the evil that had permeated the air that night, all I sensed now was a strange light and the strong scent of apples. Her hands remained chained over her head. She winced, arching her back. The totem wasn't lighting up, and I wasn't sure what was happening. The roar came again from where she stood. Black glistening claws tore through the shirt on her right side, and a massive grizzly bear stepped down beside her. Its ethereal body glowed blue and white. The mighty beast studied the cloaked figures with a half-skeletal face. The bear pushed off with its front legs, towering over Emery. With a swipe of those long claws, the chain holding Emery shattered like glass. Green magic swirling around her hands, she glared at the cloaked figures. Kill them, Emery whispered, and the bear charged forward faster than should have been possible. The beast rampaged through the lines of cloaked figures, ripping into them with claws and massive teeth that tore through skin and muscle like paper. Several shifters attempted to shift, but the bear attacked them, stopping the change and flinging them into the woods. Three vampires rushed Emery. She raised her hand, her eyes narrowing, and yelled for them to stop. They slid to a halt in the dirt, toppling over each other at the command. Unable to move, they were helpless to fend off the grizzly when it turned its anger on them. Gentry! Alistair shouted. 
I fell to the ground, to avoid being stabbed by a wicked jagged-edged silver knife. The shifter who talked to us first sneered, tossing the knife to his other hand, crazed expression on his face. She will have what she desires. He slashed the knife toward me. I leaped back, snatched his wrist, twisted his arm, and flipped him over my back. The knife fell from his hand, but a second blade stabbed my thigh. Nearby, Alistair fought a pack of cloaked figures. Blood covered his face. Whether it was his or the enemy's, I couldn't tell. The shifter in my grasp grabbed for the knife. I shoved him away as another shifter rushed me from the side. While I blocked her attack, another knife stabbed my side. The shifter twisted the blade, eliciting a bellow of rage from me. Another attacker latched on my back, driving the tip of a knife into my throat. The shifter with the crazed eyes scooped up his blade, aiming for my heart. Time to say goodbye, he whispered and with a yell, sprinted forward to finish me off. The glowing body of the grizzly loomed behind us, its lips pulled back in a snarl. The attackers holding me sprinted away at the sight of the huge bear, except for the shifter holding the silver blade. He wasn't so lucky. He turned, ready to attack, but the bear was quicker. It slashed its claws across the shifter's throat. A sickening gurgle came from him while he collapsed to his knees, clutching at his neck. The grizzly snorted, landing heavily on its front paws. The undead side of the bear's head faced me, one white eye pinning me with a frigid gaze that did the opposite of making me cold. A comforting warmth, reminding me of emery, surrounded my body. Bluish tendrils of energy, coming from the bear, sought out the wounds I'd experienced during the fight. Gasping as the knives were tugged from my body, I watched in awe while the healing magic centered on my injuries. This is death magic. I murmured. I've never known it to do this, Alistair whispered from next to me. The same light sought out his wounds and sealed them. Because no one ever talks about this side of it. Emery approached, her face still skull-like in appearance, her black hair fluttering around her shoulders. Black irises vined in her wake and trailed up her legs. The tattoos on her right arm glimmered blue and white with her magic. My jaw dropped at the raw and powerful beauty that was Emery. The healing light returned to the bear, leaving me bewildered by what I'd witnessed tonight. She rested her hand on the grizzly's head, smiling softly at the massive beast. You ready? The bear nudged her hand and lifted its front legs off the ground. The ethereal light of its massive body compressed. It returned to Emery's side from where it had sprouted. Through the tear in the fabric, the bear tattoo was visible, covering most of Emery's ribcage. Her face returned to normal, and the glow along her arms and in her eyes dimmed. Would a heartless killer save you? Emery whispered, her words cutting me deeper than the knives had. The hurt in those green depths crushed my heart. Her eyes fluttered. Her heart raced. She collapsed. I lunged forward, catching her before she hit the ground. Bastard, she mumbled, her body going limp in my arms. I searched her face, but she was out. What the hell just happened? Alistair, appearing as lost as I felt, joined me. I have no idea. She saved our lives. We can't hand her over to the guard now. I know, I replied quietly, brushing my fingers down her right arm. She didn't kill the vampires. Question is, who did? And who are these people? The clearing was filled with bodies in various stages of unconsciousness and death, mostly thanks to Emery's bear. The totem was quiet, without the chant to bring it to life. Any idea what that thing is? None. We need to get her back to the academy, Alistair said. Then you and I are going to get the guard and bring them here. How are we going to explain all of this without mentioning her? Alistair's brow furrowed. You care for her, even after knowing the truth. I hoisted Emery into my arms, straightened, and headed toward the fortress without another word. My head ached and it wasn't from the fight. It was like someone punched a hole through my chest, tearing apart everything I thought I knew about necromancers and death magic. What I witnessed Emery do, how she healed us, I'd never seen someone do that. I owed her my life, we both did. I tensed, growling quietly while my mind replayed her screams of agony. She was safe for now, but we hadn't killed all of them. 
Quite a few ran off into the trees. They'd be back for Emery, that's what my gut told me. They'd be back to finish what they started. Alistair remained silent all the way to the fortress. He helped me sneak Emery past the guardsmen on duty. We reached her dorm without passing anyone. He just placed her hand on the door to open it when Rose poked her head out from the room next door. What the hell? What are you doing? Emery? Is she okay? She rushed forward but Alistair stopped her. What happened? Stay with her until she awakens and she can tell you herself, Alistair said. She's not hurt. Rose kept arguing with Alistair but I tuned them out. I placed Emery on her bed and tugged the blankets up when she shivered. I brushed my lips over her forehead, knowing the days to come would be hard. Tonight had changed everything for me. I didn't deserve her forgiveness or her friendship, but damn if I didn't, I hope for it all the same. I'm sorry, I whispered. We'll talk soon. Her hand found mine. Gentry, she breathed, her brow wrinkling. I squeezed her hand, forced myself to back away and rushed out of the room, snapping for Alistair. He left Rose in the doorway of Emery's dorm. She sputtered, about our being unhelpful assholes. With each step I took away from Emery, the more I came apart at the seams. For so many years my hatred and rage kept me going. I knew deep down those with death magic were evil. Now my thoughts spiraled out of control. Emery could have died tonight. The notion left an empty void where my growing fondness for her had been. Gentry. Alistair asked, resting his hand on my shoulder. I'm fine, I uttered. We need to hurry. The sun's rising soon. We picked up the pace, and I let him do the talking when we found a set of guardsmen on the first floor. Once we had the headmistress and ten more guardsmen, we set off into the woods searching for the hollow. Chapter 15 Alistair The remaining weeks of the semester flew by without any more murders. No one except for the guard and headmistress Fairmain knew about the attack in the woods. Well, she knew most of the details about it. We left out anything to do with Emery to keep her secret safe. She saved our asses. Protecting her secret was the least we could do. But when we'd returned to the hollow that night, the evidence of the fight and the totem were gone. There wasn't a trace of blood to be found or a set of tracks to follow. Gentry had been furious and took down several trees in his outburst. I covered for him the best I could, saying they threatened to attack his house. Fairmain's stern expression was enough to let me know she didn't believe every word I said, but let it slide. I told Gentry to get a grip, but for a solid week after the incident, he remained locked in his room. When he finally opened the door to let me in, the place had been trashed. His sunken eyes and trembling hands gave him the appearance of a sick vampire, not one in his prime. Being confronted with death magic so different from what had nearly killed him, broke down the very foundations of what made him the vampire he had been. That, and his feelings for Emery were too strong to simply let go of. I told him time and again to speak to her. He refused, muttering how she'd probably never talk to him again. How could he blame her after what he did? I neglected to tell Roderick about the attack, expecting Fairmain to do it herself. When she finally did, I was forced to endure a night of lectures from Roderick and Teresa about being more careful. I told them about the totem that was there, and what had been on it. Neither had been able to give me answers on what the totem might be for. Nothing in the library helped either, and I grew anxious with each passing day and not having answers. I was out in the courtyard, with a light snow falling around me, when Gentry appeared at my side. I looked him up and down. You still look like shit. Don't care. There are a few days left of class. You need to talk to her before she leaves for the holiday. What if she doesn't come back? Have you talked to her? He shot back. I hadn't though I'd tried a few times. Emery pretended I didn't exist. She no longer hid in the room on the fourth floor of the library. I'd bumped into Rose, and she'd informed me Emery was confining herself to her room when she wasn't in class, thanks to us. I'd already felt bad, but that made the guilt even worse. 
Rose had gone on to threaten that if I ever accused Emery of killing innocents again, she'd hex me so bad I'd spent the next 30 years thinking I was a mouse. I believed her too. She'd been furious. Even now, she glared any time she spotted me in the halls. I need to get to my next, Gentry's words cut off with a growled curse. I wasn't sure what his problem was until the scent of cinnamon teased my nose. We turned together, and Emery was standing only a yard away. Her hands curled around the handle of her tote bag. Her gaze turned wild, filling with fear and anger, looking from me to Gentry. She focused on him, her chest heaving. His lips parted, but whatever he tried to say came out choked. He raised his hand reaching for her and she flinched, nearly slipping in the snow. The second she rushed away, Gentry hung his head, running his hands through his hair. She's never going to talk to me again, he whispered, starting to storm off. A few steps away, he paused. If you speak to her, tell her I'm sorry for everything. Tell her yourself, I said, but he kept on walking. If I had ever second-guessed his feelings for Emery, I didn't know. They'd been real, were real. The next few weeks would be hard. Gentry couldn't be alone. I'd go home long enough to check in with Roderick, then I'd go stay with my friend to make sure he didn't do anything stupid. Somehow, I'd get him through this latest disaster. But first, I had to speak to Emery. I wasn't leaving for the break until I did. Wondering if I should bring some magical protection, I decided to take whatever she threw at me and speak with her tomorrow. Chapter 16 Emery Each day leading up to the end of the semester, I expected to get a knock on my door from the guard to arrest me. Only they never came. I hadn't spoken to Gentry or Alistair since we escaped the hollow. I had no idea who had wanted to kidnap me or why, but the incident had left me shaken. I hardly left my dorm room and anxiously awaited the last day of classes so Rose and I could head home over the holiday. She'd freaked out when I finally awakened in my room, the day following the kidnapping. She rambled on about running into Alistair and Gentry when they brought me back, but they hadn't told her a damn thing. I'd given her a rundown of what happened, including the argument I had with them and the addition of a new tattoo. The grizzly bear covered my entire right side and stretched across my stomach, bearing large canines and a furious snarl captured on my skin. She moved when my thoughts shifted to Gentry. Don't worry, I murmured, resting my hand on my right side. We won't be dealing with him ever again. Unless he ended up being my professor next semester. Falling back on my bed with an aggravated grunt, I glowered at the ceiling. I'd spent the last couple of weeks throwing ideas around with rows of who would have tried to steal me away. Whoever they were, they knew I was a necromancer. A shiver raced down my spine while phantom pains from that night flooded my chest. The sensation of claws digging into me was not something I wanted to relive, but it stayed with me no matter how many cleansing rituals I did. I wasn't even sure what they'd been trying to do to me. There hadn't exactly been a chance to find out how much else they knew about me before I'd had to take action to save Gentry and Alistair. Ungrateful bastards. I scrunched my eyes shut, fiddling with my raven necklace. I'd saved them, and I didn't even get a thank you. They were probably too busy figuring out how to blame the murders on me. Why would Gentry and Alistair believe I wasn't involved with them? Simple as this. I had death magic. That made me the enemy. Angry tears burned in my eyes and I rolled over, burying my face in my pillow. It shouldn't hurt this much, Gentry's betrayal and the hatred I'd seen in his eyes but it did. He'd made me feel safe like I didn't have to be so afraid of living my life. Now, I had to wonder if he was going to be the vampire who came after me next. I didn't know why he despised my kind so much, and frankly didn't give a damn not anymore. A knock at my door startled me off the bed. Trembling, I held my breath and waited for whoever it was to go away. A second knock, louder this time. I backed into the wall, staring at the door. Emery, Alistair called. It's just me. I need to talk to you. Please. Why? I spat. I came to say I'm sorry. Can you open the door? 
I promise, I'm only here to talk. Why the hell should I believe you, huh? You have every right not to, but I'm not going away until we talk. Clenching my hands at my sides, I drew courage from the bare tattoo marking my skin and marched to the door. I yanked it open, finding Alistair alone in the corridor. He even had the decency to look guilty. Good. What? Can I come in? I squeezed the doorknob until my fingers cramped. Fine. I stepped back and let him in, closing the door behind him. What do you want? Talk fast. He shoved his hands in the pockets of his slacks, a tick starting in his jaw. I am sorry for everything we suspected you of and put you through. It wasn't fair of us to assume anything. Whatever, I muttered, wrapping my arms around myself. I don't expect you to accept my apology or gentries, he said, and I barked a laugh. He's sorry. Really? He is. Then why isn't he with you? Can't stand to be in the same room as me now, is that it? This situation right here is exactly why my kind isn't coming out of hiding, I added. I didn't ask to have this birthmark or be touched by death magic. Alistair hung his head. I truly am sorry. You saved our lives out there, and we can't repay that debt. But I wanted to tell you, your secret is safe. I swear on my life we won't tell a soul. It's the least we can do. My anger eased a tiny bit. And Gentry's okay with this? They were his words, he replied. He walked quickly for the door, then paused. He needs time to accept the truth. There's a lot you don't know about him and his past. Why he's this way. Kind of how you don't trust vampires. But I did trust a vampire, didn't I? I whispered, holding his gaze. I trusted Gentry. I let him in. He doesn't get to use his past as an excuse or a shield. I'm finished with him. Done. You can tell him that for me. I choked on the last few words but didn't back down. Alistair rubbed the back of his neck hard, then finally said he'd pass the message along. One last thing I didn't get a chance to tell you sooner. We went back to the hollow right after. There was nothing there to tell us who was after you. We left you out of our story to the guard, but with no leads to go on, there's nothing they can investigate. I'm sorry. Not like you care. I'm the enemy, remember? Not to me, he stated. And whether you believe it, not to Gentry either. Get out, I snapped, not about to fall apart in front of him. He opened the door and I rushed to it, slamming it shut in his face. Resting my hands on the door, my head fell forward, and I stopped myself from shouting in aggravation. Spinning around, I slid to the floor, letting the tears finally fall. This semester had not gone according to plan. The spring would be different. I'd keep to myself, not talk to anyone. I pressed my hands to my eyes, willing the tears to stop when a flicker of a memory greeted me. Gentry leaning over me in my room. He whispered something and kissed my forehead. My heart broke while I sat on the floor, wishing I'd never talked to Gentry. I'd take the few weeks over the holiday to move on and shove him behind him. A murderer was still on the loose, and the question remained regarding who wanted to kidnap me. Nothing else mattered. Certainly not a dark-eyed vampire who nearly stole my heart. Thank you for listening. This has been a Ciara Graves book. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of new releases.